here. We are here in the safe. We are in the safe with you. Hello, and uh, welcome to the Quest for Interdisciplinarity. Thank you for joining us in this global online conference, where we will have the privilege of counting with the contributions of many people who are engaged in making the best possible contribution for the fight against COVID-19. The pandemic calls for um, a concerted action uh, from different areas of expertise with a truly interdisciplinary action. Um, that's how INL works, um, by joining experts from 40 different nationalities and scientific fields to come up with solutions that would not be possible otherwise. For that reason, we believe to be in a good position to call for this global response action and invite everyone to be part of the solution. Now, with you for some introductory words, um, the Director General of the uh, International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, Professor Lars Montelius. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Very welcome to this conference. And uh, it's a pleasure to see so many people gathering here, as well as knowing so many people being online, watching us and seeing what we're doing here. And uh, I think we should start by maybe just uh, a, a short moment to think about all the victims of the pandemics and all the first line workers and all the blue light people that have put their services to our society and all the people that are securing that society is working although we're having these pandemics around us. 
And we are gathering here, as George said, people with different nationalities, people with different disciplines, people with different views, and we all are needed in order to fight together, in order to save lives. I think this is one of the moments in, I think, in, in lifetimes that only happens a few times, and now it's a time for all of us really to work together without boundaries. So with these words, I hand the word back to, to George. Thank you very much, Professor Lars. Now joining us from Spain, one of the INL member states, we will have the Spanish Minister for Science, Innovation and Universities, Pedro Duque. Minister Pedro Duque, welcome to our conference. Well, good afternoon to everybody. Um, certainly we are proudly uh, members and, uh, and uh, participants in the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory. And, uh, and this is uh, one of the excellent examples of the fruitful collaboration that we are having. And it is increasing between uh, Spain and Portugal and uh, us building a sort of uh, strength together within the European Union. Uh, it is uh, the vision of the INL, but uh, you will probably be briefed by the, uh, the experts and the managers here to uh, extend the membership and the international collaboration to, uh, to other countries beyond Spain and Portugal. And uh, that uh, certainly will, will cement much more strongly the, the, the basis of the collaboration that we have started. Uh, it is uh, clear to all of us that uh, we are in the middle, as uh, the director was saying, of one of the most uh, severe uh, well, uh, happenings or like the, the most severe events that has happened in, in human history or at least in the, in the uh, recent history. And, and this has been a uh, global threat threats to all of our societies. Uh, as we have already said, a uh, no, big number of citizens having uh, suffered from it and many uh, deaths. And therefore, I think it has some summoned the uh, global response. And this has been uh, quite overwhelming. And I think that uh, we will learn a lot about uh, things that we thought we couldn't do, or we thought it was very difficult to organize, but but in the in the push that uh, this pandemic has given to us, um, we have learned that uh, many of the, for example, interdisciplinary collaborations that we always strive for are more possible than than we thought, and we have probably learned a lot from there. In INL, uh, certainly as in every other scientific center, then they, they thought about what, what can we do? And I have heard about uh, the fabrication of face shields, which is obviously a modest contribution from such a uh, high technology center, but uh, it was what's, what was needed at that moment. But then uh, very soon there will be, uh, th there was a, a collaboration that, uh, that we have celebrated between the INL and probably will take place and it will it will materialize soon between the INL and the, uh, the center in Spain, ICN2, where they are developing sensors uh, for, um, for the disease COVID-19. Uh, As you know, we are still lacking. Human technology doesn't yet have a quick method to to determine if somebody has or doesn't have uh, the virus inside uh, that the person. So uh, we have to, uh, the tests that we have uh, depend on, on complex uh, solutions like the, what we are now, everybody knows as the, the, the acronym PCR and nanotechnology has possibly uh, a quite a good solution for that. And we are hoping that uh, in, in due time we'll have it uh, working for everybody. Between Spain and Portugal, as I said, there's increasing collaboration. We have uh, cemented a supercomputing network that we also call Iberian. Well, everybody 
we're going to call everything Iberian uh, from now on when, when there is collaboration. And I think that's a, a sufficiently ancient word so that it is obviously right. And our supercomputing network is going to consist of very, very powerful supercomputers soon. So far, Portugal has uh, entered what we earlier called the, the Spanish supercomputing network, and there's a good collaboration there. And with the new European Union supercomputers, this is going to be materialized too. We also have um, a very special collaboration in the synchrotron that uh, is uh, located in Barcelona, what we call ALBA. And in there, Portuguese uh, researchers are already integrated into the, into the research that is performed in ALBA. So we have uh, learned that um, we are much better and we have uh, better success together uh, in all collaborations that we do international. And uh, we are hoping that uh, soon we will extend this collaboration, this Iberian collaboration to also uh, medical research um, so that we also in our area of the world, we also enter the era soon of uh, personalized and precision medicine and, and of course all of this is still in the making and I have uh, proposed to uh, to Manuel Aitor the minister in Portugal that if we if we start a program then sh we shall start it together and hopefully we will extend uh, our collaboration Iberian collaboration to also the medical research in Spain um, well, it has been a little bit difficult to, let's say, um, coordinate things during these pandemics because everything has gone so quickly and uh, every different area of research we have needed to work um, in a very fast mode and and the collaboration has suffered a little bit and, and cooperation, but we are recovering from there. In Spain, we have um, started very quickly a special fund. We have already uh, handed out uh, approximately 24 million euros to uh, several dozen pro, uh, medical uh, and, and innovative uh, research projects. This has been quite a great success. There are obviously uh, medical clinical trials, but uh, also uh, in there, there's also uh, vaccine pro programs. Currently in Spain, we have 10 lines of uh, researching for the vaccine and uh, part of them are funded by that uh, special, very quick, um, very quick fund. And uh, one other thing that we have done and there we are trying to see if uh, other countries maybe can um, take it as an example, it's a massive, let's say, study on seroprevalence on the state of the pandemics in Spain. And, uh, and we have done it with, uh, with great effort, but uh, I think with, uh, with very solid um, scientific basis. And therefore, we believe that, uh, that uh, this is, will be one of those things that we could offer it as a collaboration to other parts of the world. So... In, in essence, uh, I believe that we have uh, been able to rehearse everywhere in Spain and Portugal and probably in many other parts of Europe. The fact that we can be interdisciplinary and that the problems or let's say the obstacles on doing that were much less than we thought. Now we have uh, learned a lot and we hope that this interdisciplinary work that we have started forced by the pandemic will continue in the future. Thanks. Thank you very much, Minister Pedro Duque. Uh, we expect the fastest and the best possible recovery for Spain, one, unfortunately one of the most hit countries in the world by COVID-19, but we will uh, come out of this together, as you were saying, Minister Pedro Duque. Thank you. Joining us online, we have also the mayor of Braga, the city where INL is headquartered. Um, mayor Ricardo Rio, welcome. Thank you, Charles.
we would like very much to hear you, uh, Mayor Ricardo Rio. I think there are some issues with the sound. Can you hear me now? Now, yes. loud and clear. Thank you very much. I was greeting you first and then thanking Lars Mantelius for the invitation to attend and to participate in this seminar, which is an honor for, for Braga to, to see INL always as a stage for this type of discussions and currently in this specific issue of a phenomena that is a global phenomena. As we can see probably in recent years, this was the event, the, the thing that happened more simultaneously at uh, the global level, because as we can see daily in the news, we even with different circumstances that are obviously, obviously connected with the realities of each of the territories and the countries, uh, we see precisely the same challenges happening in South America, in the USA, in Russia, in the Middle East, in Africa, or in any of the European countries. And therefore, uh, the commitment uh, worldwide and the sharing of experiences in an initiative like this one is very, impo very important. Also, a uh, greeting for the ministers of science from Portugal and uh, from Spain, to all the other panelists and to all the ones that are attending this um, conference. And, and I think that one of the biggest uh, news of this uh, COVID phenomena is the first time in which we are attending some sort of uh, real-time scientific development. Because uh, as many times we have heard, uh, any, nobody was prepared for this reality, even if Bill Gates uh, announced uh, something like this a couple of years ago. But in any case, uh, from governments to companies to scientific institutions to health providers, uh, there was really no um, preparation to deal with this uh, reality as we had to do in the late, uh, latest months. And uh, at the same time, from all these institutions and at the same time from the common citizen, there is some sort of uh, sense of urgency that uh, we can also deal with some sort of uh, scientific validation of all the things that are happening. It's not only about uh, the trends and the forecasts that we can make on how the uh, infection can progress. It's on uh, practical issues like uh, should we or not use a mask? Uh, should we or not clean a certain surface? Uh, what can uh, help to, to spread the disease in a certain circumstance? And uh, as we can see on a daily basis, there's still a lot of arguments uh, from different theories on each of these subjects. And, uh, and this is something that is quite a challenge because uh, uh, we, we don't have a background to all the decisions, a scientific background to all the decisions that, for instance, at the political level, we have to, to deal with. And uh, both at the national, the regional and the local level, and mainly in Portugal, we had to, to deal with very different situations. Uh, it was not just uh, saying to people that they should be at home for a couple of weeks. It was how we had to deal with the uh, health and challenges throughout this period to support the, um, the work of the health professionals, of the health institutions, to deal with the special uh, parts of our population, how we could help the elderly people, both the ones that were isolated on their homes and the ones that were uh, in uh, retirement houses, the way that we had to deal with schools. And uh, just today, we are, or these weeks, we are reopening the schools and all the challenges that uh, also came from those um, initiatives. Uh, how we could help the, the people with less resources to, to meet, obviously, their, their needs throughout this period. And uh, all the economies worldwide are now struggling and we have not only throughout the recent months, but mainly in the upcoming days, obviously some challenges that are very hard to deal with because uh, it's just not about clapping your hands so that the, the economy recovers uh, after the pandemic goes by. Uh, by. And um, obviously we, we have also uh, the economic concern on how we have to, to, to help the, econ the, the companies to strive and to, to deal with these new rules and this new situation that comes from the pandemic. And uh, for all of that, obviously, the connection between common sense, uh, political decisions, and uh, the scientific validation of those decisions, it's uh, sometimes 
uh, a very tough uh, dialogue that we have to deal with because uh, we sometimes have to take decisions that are not so sustainable and that are not real they don't, they don't rely on specific advices from from uh, from the scientists and therefore i think that uh, uh, this was also very important to bring uh, science uh, closer to citizens uh, throughout this period and obviously to stimulate what is the main theme of this conference which is to gather uh, specialists from different areas to make them share their experiences to uh, so that they could achieve a common goal which is to protect people and obviously to help them cope with this situation and the way that uh, many institutions and many health institutions many scientific institutions many companies have ad adapted themselves to uh, produce masks to produce tests to develop some immunity tests is something that i think is very important and it's a good lesson for the future because obviously it can obviously be replicated in other areas in the future and i have to greet inl and uh, also the uh, school of medicine which is uh, here pre represented by the represented by nuno sozo its director for all the work that they have been, been doing in the latest weeks and obviously wishing them the biggest success in the common effort that we all are struggling for Thank you for the invitation once again. Thank you very much, Mayor Ricardo Rio. So the quest is global, but um, we'll have to rely uh, heavily on the local actors. And um, um, one of the examples is uh, INL. Uh, we uh, will do it from Braga to the world. have with us uh, in a few moments uh, the Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Education of Portugal, Manuel Leitor. Um, for now, uh, we will have with us uh, Rangarajan uh, Sampath, the Chief Scientific Officer of the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics from Switzerland. Everyone is with eyes on people like you, Professor. Thank you, um, thank you, Lars, and thank you to the organizers for inviting Fine uh, to this forum. Uh, truly uh, timely and, and needed, and glad to see uh, the Iberian uh, spirit coming through. Find is a global uh, NGO, not-for-profit organization, um, working to bring diagnostics to resource-limited settings in the um, uh, to the low-income country settings uh, in the world. We are headquartered in Geneva and at a WHO collaborating center. We've been working in diagnostics for uh, nearly two decades now. Uh, and our sole focus is to ensure that uh, timely and accessible diagnostics are both developed and available where they're needed. 
So, you know, um, this is truly a grim situation as all of us have seen over the last uh, three months, three to four months now since uh, January with the COVID uh, outbreak. And as the world is uh, struggling to contain uh, this outbreak and, and find a way to move forward, what has clearly emerged is the um, healthcare infrastructure, um, even in uh, what was otherwise uh, robust economies have been um, very challenging. And the testing capacity has emerged as a huge issue. And for us as uh, diagnostics uh, uh, players, this is a, a, a key um, uh, un, you know, understanding of how the uh, capacity we think about uh, normally in, in, in normal times of disease management in infectious diseases, how that's been overwhelmed by this uh, pandemic. Um, and this is worldwide. I mean, so adequate testing capacity for SARS, I don't have to you know, tell this audience, uh, that has been lacking worldwide. Um, uh, we talked about the experience in uh, in your own region uh, as well in the rest of Europe as well as in the U.S. has uh, been uh, pretty challenging and, and daunting. And these emerging cases and the rapidity with which this happened has truly overwhelmed the system. So with that, our uh, thoughts immediately were to more of the resource limited settings in Africa, Southeast Asia and Latin America, for instance, which face an even more acute struggle because they, even on a uh, what you would consider a routine healthcare uh, setting, they are quite vulnerable. And this kind of a situation makes them even more vulnerable. So uh, what FIND has been doing essentially um, in order to contain uh, this sort of humanitarian uh, as well as economic fallout of the, of the COVID pandemic, is trying to focus on where uh, we need to focus efforts urgently. Uh, well, of course, this is needed in diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, uh, but uh, I'll stick to diagnostics because as you can imagine, without finding the um, uh, cases uh, and finding them fast, uh, it's very hard to respond to them in real time. And uh, that's going to be one of the keys, I think, um, as we move forward also. So one of our uh, priorities as we uh, look uh, beyond the uh, first few months of the response into where we sort of go forward is also in looking at how we can expand testing sort of at a population level, uh, what you might call mass testing and how to improve access to diagnostics to everyone who needs them. Uh, otherwise the disease uh, uh, spread will be hard to contain. And a lot of the focus on innovation and scale up of uh, tests that are needed to ensure that uh, we can get these tests developed and deployed in uh, all the countries where they need it, because there's really no global boundary. If you can't contain this in any one part of the world, uh, rest of the world continues to remain vulnerable. Um, we, you know, and this is clearly something that's going to uh, affect uh, both from a uh, diagnostic perspective, but at the end of the day, it's, it has huge impact uh, around uh, all, all different aspects. Uh, the way we are doing this is uh, along with, the, uh, with WHO, with Global Fund, and a number of other organizations, we have partnered, and we are a uh, you know, partnership-driven organization, so we have uh, um, worked very well over the last several uh, uh, years uh, with many of these uh, global health players. But we are continuing to expand on those and bring more partners in to really focus around the needs, uh, understanding where the critical needs are uh, in uh, addressing the challenges. Uh, while uh, right from the start of the outbreak, we have sort of focused quite a bit on uh, a diagnostic pipeline, understanding where the different diagnostics supply, where are the different manufacturers, uh, we've also uh, uh, established a platform uh, with which to evaluate these tests, sort of provide a uh, um, uniform access to data, which has been critical as uh, many of our experiences have told and the absence of data, many decisions get that made, uh, get made that uh, really are counterproductive. So rapid evaluation of tests to provide uh, um, uh, data, both to regulators uh, and country policymakers, but as well to developers to say where they, you know, where the need for further improvement is, uh, is critical. We've been working very closely with uh, other partners in terms of managing diagnostic supply chains, uh, uh, ensuring that there is, uh, uh, you know, access to all kinds of materials from swabs to uh, actual tests to other uh, ancillaries that are needed in, a, in order to be able to do these um, uh, testing effectively. Uh, more recently, as you may have known, at the beginning of May, there was a European call uh, as part of the um, ACT, the acceleration of uh, COVID tools. Uh, we are, uh, along with uh, Global Fund, leading the accelerator diagnostic partnership. And a number of uh, key players uh, from the Gates Foundation to welcome to us to uh, UNICEF and UNITAID and a number of others 
uh, are uh, key partners with us on this uh, in uh, ensuring we can get diagnostics uh, throughout the world. Uh, the four main pillars on which this is sort of built uh, are around uh, ensuring there is uh, rapid access to innovation and diagnostic tools. These are essentially uh, ensuring that there are high performing diagnostics that can be used and mass deployed uh, at the population level so that they can be really uh, quickly uh, used and as well build the uh, digital capacity to um, get uh, diagnostic solutions uh, captured and, uh, and deployed uh, properly. We also have um, um, uh, activities uh, uh, with partners in uh, defining the market um, uh, access, uh, regulatory support, as well as shaping, uh, uh, providing a marketplace in which uh, the diagnostics tests could be made available so the countries could actually procure them through a global supply chain uh, uh, process, uh, supporting cost uh, for these manufacturing and deployment in these uh, low resource setting, I think it, it is key, as well as to strengthen the country capacity uh, overall. So uh, for us, uh, the main uh, focus has been understanding, uh, and given that this is sort of worldwide, looking at it from the lens of what is needed in uh, economies such as uh, in, in Spain or Portugal or uh, in uh, Switzerland, where we are based, as well as in the rest of Europe, but at the same time, keeping an eye to the really vulnerable population uh, where we uh, have an obligation to ensure that uh, the right tools are deployed at the right setting so that we can um, actually contain uh, uh, these um, outbreaks locally and provide the rapid uh, support for uh, diagnostics or uh, for therapeutic or vaccine deployment when they become available through uh, appropriate use of diagnostics, uh, all, uh, all along keeping in mind that the cost of the population to the population is extremely high, and these are very urgent needs. Um, I can stop there uh, and just uh, uh, thank you again to the organizers for putting this meeting together and happy to be part of this um, consortium. Thank you, Rangarajan Sampath. Um, we wish you success because it will be also our success. Now with us, uh, representing the other member states of uh, INL, we have the Portuguese Minister of Science, Technology and Higher Ed Education, uh, Manuel Leitor. Thank you, Minister. Um, people all over the world are now turning to scientists. Uh, in a time like this, uh, how important it is to invest in science. Thank you very much and uh, let me welcome you all to INL. I apologize for being slightly late. Um, but I should and I would like to start with a special reference to INL. I remember the, that INL has been created more than 12 years ago under three major goals. To be an intergovernmental organization, to do experimental research in the leading edge of knowledge and to address key societal challenges. So the time for INL is more than ever a great opportunity because we need more and more intergovernmental organizations, we need experimental research, and we need to be able to address with more knowledge key societal challenges. And this needs people, 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 people in interacting with, with, with each other. We cannot rely on only on distance and remote collaboration. We need a physical presence of researchers, so this meeting is very important to also uh, in some way recognize all of those that during the pandemic crisis has been here in the INL labs working in a daily life, keeping all the clean rooms and all the labs. And we expect now now that's namely in Portugal, we are from next week opening up um, the, the full institutions to real again um, reopen fully INL for experimental research, which we know cannot be done in great part in, in remotely and needs a physical um, a, a physical um, presence. So. My, uh, my, my main um, idea here to, to, again, thank you, all of you, for um, uh, bringing your ideas, for working in experimental research in the leading edge of our knowledge, is to bring two major ideas and two lines of actions. The idea, the, the first idea is essentially to call your attention for the need for scientific activism. 
we live in times where, in fact, everyone is looking for science, and these do require a strong social responsibility from researchers and an immediate answer. Why this is different? Because all of us know, from a science point of view, that science requires time. Science certainly requires a space. Science is, requires the concentration of researchers, but requires time. And now we need to very well understand what we can do right now with the knowledge which is available these days, and the knowledge we need to further produce in the months and years to come. This has been always like that, but in these times of uh, great global um, social and health crisis, everyone is asking fast responses for, to science. And therefore, in my view, the scientific activism we need is also to show people what science can do right now with available or reliable knowledge and what we need more knowledge and invest more in knowledge. 50 years ago, John Zyman, a great European citizen, professor at Cambridge University, published a very important book, Science is, is Real, or Real Science, and a few years later, Reliable Knowledge, where he exactly showed that science is a, a strong social issue, and we need to be able to understand to the public opinion what we can do today, what we cannot do, and we need time to do, to do better. And this crisis has shown and has brought to the attention a number of, from fake news to a strong misunderstanding what science can do, what science cannot do. Between scientific community, we know that we need more science. People at large do not know. And for instance, when we look at Europe at large in the last 20 years, the overall um, investment in R&D in Europe is quasi stagnant over the last 20 years because people don't understand why we need to increase further the investment in science. And therefore, these are critical times for scientists, what I call scientific activism, to show people, to communicate better what we can do and why we need more the taxpayer to involve more in, um, in science. The second idea, which is related but is different, is science. The crisis has shown us that we live in a risk society. And it is not possible to pass the message to a population that it is, is ever conceived to um, work and live in a zero risk society. And this has become very difficult for people to understand because most of our education trends to say that the risk is taken by the state. We don't want to face risks. And my point is that our scientists, which are those which are able located to explain to the population at large that we need to learn how to live and live more and more in a risk society because now we have this risk tomorrow we will have another risk, either from the health point of view or from social or economic um, point of view. So living in a risk society can only be done with more science. And I believe this concept that we need science and scientists explaining to the world and to our friends and neighbors and every citizens that we need more science to, to address risks. So under these two ideas, scientific activism and the need for science to face an increasing risk society, I believe we need to measure lines of action. First, to mobilize ideas in a time framework, and second, to um, give and contribute for a global answer. Again, INL being intergovernmental, being experimental research, and being oriented to address global changes is very well positioned to address and to contribute with others, with scientists all over the world, certainly in Portugal and Spain, to address to a global answer. But the message I believe we need to ask everyone is threefold. To coordinate actions, which is very difficult, to collaborate with each other across different disciplines, and to cooperate with those, and particularly the weaker and the most vulnerable, particularly we are facing now 
sit critical situations, for instance, in, in Latin America or in Africa, and we need to better understand how we can coordinate actions at an European level, this needs coordination, but also how can we better collaborate in an open um, scientific point of view, but certainly also to co collaborate with others. And these three messages, coordinate, collaborate and cooperate, are particularly critical in my point of view to address this global answer to COVID-19. Um, COVID certainly, we, we, Portuguese and um, um, Iberian citizens, and I speak from Portugal, but I'm sure that Pedro Duque and our colleagues from Spain want really to collaborate in the global answer. And we know that in Portugal and Spain, we are ready and we have the capacity to contribute with the solutions at the three different levels which has been um, um, established um, under the global response to COVID-19. In the, in the short time frame on the diagnostics, INL itself is providing new ideas for diagnostics. Throughout Portugal, we have many research groups and centers heavily involved in uh, new diagnostics from nanotechnologies to uh, serological testing to other types of uh, testing, small companies, larger companies, research groups, and we need to better integrate because we want to make part of this global, um, um, global um, response. Then, in a, in, a, in a longer time frame, in the therapeutics um, partnership, this again has provided, particularly in the Portuguese context, critical issues in the supply of key components for new therapeutics. And actually, this is a completely new area because we know that 80% of the current European pharma industry rely on the, on the um, suppliers from Asia, from India and China. So this is also an opportunity to promote and grow um, the supply of raw materials and key components for therapeutics in Europe at large, and we need to really identify and to in in introduce those in the global uh, answer. And last but not least, the, the time frame we need to really develop a vaccine. And the message in this session I want to pass is that Portugal, Portuguese research institutions, together certainly with INL and Spain, should be actively engaged in bringing um, um, a, an increasing Iberian participation to, um, to the global response and certainly to the European response. And again, I say this because, and I conclude with this statement, the, the global response to COVID-19 has also brought, at least has accelerated, not brought, has accelerated a process which we have seen over the last decade uh, associated with the increasing role of large private foundations to sponsor research, particularly also in, in, the, in the European level, and in a framework which needs to be of strong collaboration between different type of entities which have the different decision-making processes. Governments usually rely on public money and they do open competitions. Certainly private competition, private foundations have their own means to distribute the funding. And again, this is not new. We have seen those in the AIHV um, competition. We have seen that in, in Ebola. But now more and more, we have seen that this global response is putting together large private foundations, governments, um, 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 and firms to, together. And this should pay our attention. This is very important, a good news but we also need to address how the, the funding will be distributed to make sure that everyone is able to collaborate to the, to the global um, response, either in terms of new diagnostics or new therapeutics or vaccine partnerships. Portugal, together with Spain and others, in the European framework and in the European research and innovation framework, we have been very active to make sure that all the European funds is open to, um, is open accessible to everyone 
throughout Europe. We don't want to have regional um, 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 outcomes. We want to compete with the best, but we need to guarantee that funding is available to everyone. And again, here, we need to guarantee that the collaboration between governments and um, private foundations and large firms is also um, in a way that can provide open access to these funds to every single good ideas. And we have good ideas in Portugal, I'm sure good ideas in Spain, like good ideas in India or in China or in Brazil. And we need to give open access to all these ideas. And I'm telling this because we know this is a critical issue in all these processes of collaboration and coordination. The access to the large amounts of funds which are putting together under the global response should, may, should be of open access to every single idea, to every single researcher, to the best research groups and the best research uh, ideas only in terms of their excellence and their scientific excellence and not based in any type of, of um, uh, selection based on the type of institution or the type of region they came from. Portugal has been always a country open to open collaboration. We have been fighting a lot in European and other contexts for open science. We know it has become a very difficult debate at a political and scientific issue. We are far away, far away in Europe and in the world to have a full open scientific approach and open science strategy throughout. And I believe, again, the global response to COVID-19 has become a, another unique opportunity to show to the world that scientists can collaborate in an open way and also we need a strong open collaboration between the private foundations, governments and firms which are bringing together this global uh, response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Manuel Leitor. Um, I would call uh, on the synthetic uh, speech capabilities of uh, everyone of our uh, participants. Uh, Minister Manuel Leitor uh, has spoken about uh, Europe and uh, European efforts. Well, coincidentally, the next uh, participant is Renzo Tomellini, uh, head of unit at the G DG RTD at the European Commission. Professor Renzo Tomellini, welcome. Is it, uh, is it connected now? We are yes. listening to you so, right now. Thank you. Senor Ministro Don Pedro Duque, or Senor Ministro Manuel Hector, Senoras y Senores, uh, ladies and gentlemen, nice to see you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to hear progress of uh, the Iberic Laboratory because I was uh, collaborating with Professor Jose Rivas, uh, I think 15 years ago. Uh, at the moment of the conception and preparation of the business plan, scientific plan of the I Iberic Laboratory. I think I've never been in, in Braga uh, after the opening of the laboratories. I was always in Braga before the opening of the laboratory. So just a very quick uh, um, uh, element because uh, Minister Pedro Duque, Minister Manuel Eitor mentioned the, the resources, the funding, so the fuel for uh, uh, fueling the activities in research and innovation, and uh, indeed uh, it is what it is done also at uh, uh, European level with a lot of uh, uh, dynamism and a lot of intervention and the capacity of reorienting the funds along the three uh, lines, test, prevent and treat. So test, early detection and monitoring to save lives and pre preserve the healthcare system, prevent protecting the people and stopping the epidemic, treat early treatment to save lives and to accelerate the recovery. So this operation now and accelerated the exit from the epidemics. Uh, I know that when you come from Brussels, uh, it's important to give the figures, the numbers, because it, uh, it, uh, it's, uh, um, it's important to, to, uh, to give an idea of the ambition of the effort. For the moment, already 325 million euros have been mobilized, but these figures will be topped up with further 675 million to reach 
1 billion of uh, euros. This 1 billion will be organized into three blocks, 450 million for developing scientific solutions for testing, preventing, and treating, as I was saying, against the coronavirus and developing the health systems, 400 million of EC guarantee of the European Investment Bank, so lending to finance pre-commercial stage investments in COVID-19 research and development, including scale-up of production facilities that were also mentioned uh, by the, um, uh, both ministers a moment ago, and uh, 150 million for disruptive innovations on COVID-19 under the European Innovation Council uh, Accelerator. So um, now this, uh, in three minutes, uh, I cannot go into, into detail, but uh, I just uh, mentioned the uh, IMI, the Coalition for Epidemic and the, uh, Preparedness Innovation, the European Development Countries Clinical Trials Partnerships, uh, uh, the activity of the European Innovation Council, the activity of the European Research Council, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, is uh, uh, a panoply of actions and projects that are fueled with the money that European taxpayers gave to uh, the framework program for research and innovation. Maybe last but not least, the uh, opinion that is in preparation by the science for policy advice. So it was mentioned in particular uh, by uh, our host, Minister uh, Manuel Haters, uh, the importance of science for policy. And indeed, one of the services that is set in place at uh, uh, the level of the Commission and the Union is a science to policy advice, and uh, uh, um, I saw between the participants, amongst the participants, there is a, a professor, Elvira Fortunato, uh, who is one of the seven uh, advisors, and they are also working to deliver uh, a statement and then recommendations from the science to the policy, knowing that then are the policy makers, those who have to take the decisions for our good, but the science has to inform these decisions. Thank you, obrigado, muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Professor Tomellini. Right now, we will hand over to Antonio Novo Guerrero, President of the European Clusters Alliance. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Can you hear me? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, they are all, first of all, I want to thank INL for the opportunity to uh, participate and share experiences in this conference. In the face of the terrible crisis that we are all experiencing, the essential values of the European Union have gained maximum relevance, strength, and vitality. Those values have been embodied in thousands of initiatives through our territories. To, to develop them quickly and effectively, it has been necessary to add forces share capacities, unite wills. The title of this conference is in fact perfectly reflecting that reality. Interdisciplinarity has been, is key for better facts, the effects of this crisis. United in the diversity, we are much more capable of alleviating suffering, saving lives. It has never been more evident than now. My professional work is clusters, the innovative ecosystem that facilitate, especially for the SMEs, the collaboration, the collaborative space adapted uh, to their needs. The main activity of the cluster is to create solid, close, and trust-based collaborative relationships between companies and all uh, types of organizations, especially scientific and research institutions as well as with public administration. This is how both the so-called so industrial cluster and those focused on the social economy work. On Monday, March 16, for, from the European Cluster Alliance, we sent an email to DigiGrow, making ourselves fully available to fight the effects of COVID-19. In less than an hour, an hour, we received a very specific request. It was imperative to map the resources and capabilities identified as critical in the fight, in this fight. We split the request immediately to 
all our European network in just four days, the Commission and our national, national governments receive a detailed database with more than 1,300 1, companies and entities at the European level that quickly made their resources available for all our authorities. But we were not the only ones who moved, moved quickly. Right away, we found that some of our partners participated in more than one volunteer network, mainly those organized by some uh, social movements such as uh, Frena la Curva in Spain or the makers, which bring together technological volunteers. There, in just four days, we had contacted the main entities active in that field, agreeing with them to meet, meet daily to coordinate activities. It was not very difficult to agree. We all share a clear and practical vision. Argent needs had to be resolved and our own solution on, in the medium and long term began immediately. You will wonder how we collaborate. It, I will give examples. We agree to work on joint projects immediately without funding, public funding or just with our resources. We promote the agreement in common mass designs. We provide industrial resources to makers initiated respirator projects. We donate tons of printer suppliers to volunteer communities. When the material was scarce, we transform it from adaptable raw materials. We share our logistic networks, contracts, contacts and references on needs and availabilities. We generate a daily newsletter distribu distributed uh, across Europe a serious and credible benchmark at a time when the re reliability of the information was crucial. Just a week, in just a week, we decided that this co coordination was critical and should jump to the European level. We con convened the first European event in March 26, 26, clearly presenting that open, inclusive spirit of broad spectrum based on shared leadership. Thus was born the European Alliance Against Coronavirus, which meets at least once a day even in weekends, three figures. In eight weeks, we have had 64 via conference, adding more than 2,400 attendees to them. Those attendees include representatives from a huge spectrum of entities, purely civic movements, such as the Italian My Life Design or the Portuguese Plano de Axao, social entities, some group in social economic clusters, companies, scientific institutions, institution, research centers, universities, and uh, institutions science, uh, such as the same European Economic and Social Committee or the European Commission from multiple directorates, General, Regio, Sante, the GRC, and of course, DigiGlo. But what is really important is the results. And there are some very fast. One example, and this is concerning Spain and Portugal, on Thursday, April 26, a specific meeting was called for the teams that were developing prototypes of respirators at the European level. We found that the great, greatest difficulty holding back an a student team, the, the design of the devices control algorithms was precisely the stronger point on, on one of the Portuguese projects. They immediately began to collaborate in three days they, uh, they make results, concrete results of that collaboration. Now that the pressure on healthcare is reduced, our focus swift to new priorities. We need to support safer processes back to work, redesign a, a more flexible, green, digital and secure, competitive Europe economy, European economy. The European Commission has included clusters among the agents to be integrated into the rapid alert function announced a few weeks ago. GRU has formally commissioned us to carry out innovative proposals for the design of this rapid alert function, as well as the early identification of possible disruptions in European value chains. Prioritizing such disruptions and suggesting possible solutions to them. In addition, they ask us to identify companies that, being critical for their high technological capacity, know how, or specific productions are at risk of aggressive 
purchases by foreign capital. We are going to work on all this in the coming months. It is a great, great honor to be here today speaking to you. We need the knowledge, expertise, and capabilities that are available for you. Together, we can find the best answer to those challenges, creating synergies, and optimizing the, resource, the resources to invest. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Antonio Novo Guerrero. Um, we have uh, heard already in, in this introductory panel to talk about the Iberian uh, work that is being developed and the increasing um, work uh, that must be done uh, in cooperation between Portugal and Spain and other uh, uh, in conjunction with other European entities. Um, the next session will be exactly the Iberian perspective. So the first um, speaker for this um, uh, panel will be Eduardo Maldonado, the president of the Portuguese National Agency for Innovation, uh, the president of the board of directors. Uh, Professor Eduardo Maldonado, welcome. Good afternoon. I hope that you are hearing me from Porto. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this uh, in this uh, virtual conference now. That is the the new norm for these conferences. And let me start by by saying hello to a few faces that I have not seen for such a long time, and so it's nice to see them at least on a virtual mode. Uh, namely, if you allow me by reference to Renzo and a few years of uh, fighting in uh, Horizon 2020 committees. Um, I think the innovation system in Portugal, and I'm just going to talk about Portugal, our colleague from Spain will speak next about Spain, but the better qualification that I could say is that our innovation system went into overdrive with the crisis. And this is extremely positive because it shows that we have a very competent and active ecosystem and that it uh, created and produced ideas and solutions and uh, new uh, increased opportunities for, for many other products. Uh, there were many, many officially launched initiatives, but also many private ideas that came about, uh, unrequested, normally uh, the product of, uh, of uh, the innovators uh, thinking and activities and we saw everybody converging on the main problems of course that we already uh, uh, described here before several several people like things directly connected to COVID-19 the crisis that it provoked the solutions the diagnostics the vaccines etc what we saw also from our perspective as an innovation agency is that we did change thanks of course to uh, a changed uh, legal environment uh, crisis environment that uh, the initiatives were created with procedures that allowed quick decision making we had to act quickly we made quick decisions we made quick um, uh, we started quickly new projects and we gave the green light to many new ideas to go ahead and i must say after these three months of crisis that i cannot detect any lack of quality in these procedures so i think that uh, we should take uh, lessons from what happened, the negative things about the crisis that we all know of, but this negative aspect of the crisis brought many, many new and positive things that we probably should keep for the new normal, as now we talk about, for the future. And so we should definitely uh, get all the lessons that we learned from from the past, uh, from these past few months, and keep the good things that came out of it for the future, because uh, indeed th this is extremely important. Uh, I would say 
that we should, of course, move beyond the vaccines, treatments, and diagnostics. Um, we have to do, we have to solve those problems, but there are many others. And uh, uh, our Minister Manuel Ito already mentioned it, Portugal is opening up the society starting next week. Uh, it's already partly open. Most factories are, are already in operation again. And we have a whole economy to deal with. And so basically what we now need to do is to extend these lessons and to promote new opportunities, because the challenges, uh, in addition to COVID, still remain. We still have climate change. It did not disappear. We have the digitalization effort for the whole industry. We need, uh, as it was said, to reindustrialize Europe and uh, keep our capacity to, to, to have key production of, or production of key components and key, uh, key services in Europe and not elsewhere so that we have our independence. And when we can say about Europe, we say also about Portugal, I'm sure about Spain and every other country, we need to solve mobility. We need all kinds of challenges that did not disappear. We just went into a lag during this period. And so now we need to take care of these new opportunities and new normal must be based on innovation. We need to develop new solutions for the new normal that is coming up, new products, new services, and of course, new innovation, because this is what the future will hold. Uh, I am slightly worried, and now that uh, we have, of course, our political leaders here and the commission present, because 2020 and 2021 are transition years for the current framework program and also for the most important structural funds that we have in both Portugal and Spain for, for our work, innovation work and research, all the R&D. And so my, my appeal would be to, uh, we need to work together towards having continued sufficient funding for R&D and innovation for the next couple of years without an interruption. So we need to keep this momentum and go for the future with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the momentum that we created. And now, not just for COVID, but also for the post-COVID and for the rest of the economy. And of course, our agency here in Portugal will be tasked and is tasked with doing that. And they will do that for, for for, for our ecosystem in Portugal for the various areas. And uh, thank you very much for this initiative. Uh, at the Innovation Agency, we are ready to, to support as best as we can all this effort for the new economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Eduardo Maldonado. In about three minutes, we will uh, have here um, Alfonso uh, Valencia uh, from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center right now. Um, uh, Professor Jesus Marco, Vice President of the Spanish National Research Council. Professor Jesus. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Many thanks for this uh, kind invitation. So while hearing the previous presentations, I decided to focus on the, let's say, what we have learned in these uh, last two months. And I want to address a few points from the, uh, our perspective as a National Research Council with more than 120 centers across whole Spain and um, touching all areas of research. First one is on interdisciplinarity. Uh, when the crisis came, what we did was to set up a new platform, interdisciplinary platform that is uh, following the example we have for others um, along the preparation of the missions of uh, European uh, proposals for the next Horizon Europe. And this has worked extremely well, um, uh, joining different experts from different fields uh, that talk together. And this way we have been able to address uh, many of the challenges at short time. And we hope that also at mid and, and long term. And um, this is uh, on the positive side. Uh, uh, with this uh, mission-oriented approach, 
we were able to start to develop solutions from machines that we have four pro uh, projects ongoing, as uh, our minister has said before, some of them very with uh, high hopes. We have also on diagnostics, we have also on transmission of the virus, uh, contention measurements. Basically, we have uh, um, promoted an approach that uh, includes all the steps of the, of the challenge of the COVID-19. So for interdisciplinarity and the governance of this uh, large platform, because we have more than 200 research groups involved, this has worked quite well. Uh, it has not worked so well regarding the collaboration at a wider level, for example, with the um, other stakeholders on the health area. This uh, We have found that the, the connection between basic research and application to health is not so direct, and we have been improving a lot, and we hope we will improve much more. We need much more improvement. It has worked also very well, as our minister said before, with the calls for funding for projects. We have uh, now at national level more than 150 projects funded, addressing all the areas. And in particular for CSIC, we have many of them where the collaboration between four or five areas, different areas, and even four or five different uh, stakeholders, universities, research centers, hospitals, is working quite well. And one of the key points that I, I want to, to remark is the simplicity and flexibility of the call launched by the Institute of Health, uh, Carlos III, because this required basically two pages, and this was done uh, easily. And this is in contrast to the one of the questions that I, I addressed today to our committee of experts. Why we don't have much more uh, projects at international level, and in particular at European level? And the answer was, it takes a lot of effort and time to set up this uh, European projects. We need to, to work on, on this to simplify. And uh, we have also been not so good in the one of the key points that is uh, how our solutions and our ideas reach the society at the end. And this has been said uh, before, I think that uh, the need to connect with the um, industries, the companies uh, has to be reinforced, at least from our side. And we are working on that. We have been very much surprised by the um, impact of donations, of private donations that we have had. We have more than 10 million euros on private donations for this to CSIC. And this is very nice, but on the other hand, uh, it is quite difficult for us to reach the industries uh, the other way to make this transfer. And for that, we are thinking about um, something like a, a public-private platform on biodefense. That is something we need to have in mind for the um, potential uh, pandemic episodes in the future. So, uh, in summary, um, we have done, I would say, quite well. And finally, one of the messages uh, at the beginning of this uh, uh, two months, we were we had some contact with INL, and we have not been able to really involve closely with INL as also with other international labs. And why? And the answer, I asked this question also to Wisepa this morning, and the answer was quite clear. Basically, we had no time. Everybody was focusing on solving the project, the problems at national level. And now it is the time to extend this collaboration with some more time to address more globally the problems and to find the mechanism to promote this collaboration at Iberian level first and then at European level also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jesus Marco. Indeed, this is the time for collaboration. Um, right now, um, from the um, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, uh, its head of uh, the Department of Life Sciences, Alfonso Valencia. So I believe that uh, COVID-19 brought many, many petabytes of data to analyze in the coming months. Thank you, good afternoon. Thanks very much for the, for the invitation. It's been very interesting to follow all the possibilities of uh, transnational collaborations, in particular with Portugal. So the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is a joint venture between the Spanish government, the Catalan government, and the university, the local university, the University Polytechnic of Catalonia. We are a national infrastructure, so we host Mare Nostrum 4, which is one of the largest computers in Europe. And we also a research center with uh, around 700 uh, scientists by now. 
So the, the COVID-19 has been obviously shaking us, like all the research centers around the world. We have dedicated a, a substantial amount of effort to projects related to COVID-19. So I will give you a very short overview of some of the things that we do and uh, more, a little bit more on uh, what we see at the conclusions and, and uh, maybe uh, what is going to happen according to us in the foreseeable, foreseeable future. So um, first of all, we put the facility, the, the Mare Nostrum uh, High Performance Computer into the service of COVID project. This is now in almost all the calls, I would say in all the calls of the European Union on COVID, also in the national calls for uh, uh, high performance computers. So many of the things that are calculated by a number of projects in Europe are being calculated in, a, in, in our um, high performance center as, a, as an open uh, contribution to, to the development of this project. Uh, we are uh, developing and participating in, in, in a diversity of projects that cover a, a wide range of applications. We are a part of a number of projects in developing drugs and vaccines for the future. In this case, it's obviously our part is the computational part, finding epitopes, um, building models of proteins, building models of the binding of the antibodies, and also uh, building models of the disease progression. Uh, the contribution of genomics and uh, modeling in these cases, we see this as a way of making faster the progress in these areas that are by, by definition difficult and they work in a very strong and di uh, direct collaboration between the computational and the experimental parts. So we, we already see progress in many of these in many of these projects and we hope to have things that are going to be tried and at the end of the year in preparation for a possible uh, second wave. As a computational center, we are also involved in many other more um, was a technological project, a little bit different from the this direct collaboration with biologists. We are advising a different number of uh, parts of the government or collaborating in projects in, uh, in a range of things that goes from uh, the tracing apps, uh, uh, the possibility of following contact using uh, mobile phones, uh, a number of um, developments around assessing public opinion using natural language processing uh, methods, also tracking uh, fake news on the, on, the, on the web using natural language processing technologies and the new embeddings, the new technology for natural language processing. And we're also involved in developing models combining uh, movement and, uh, and cases, COVID-19 cases. Uh, as part of the, an effort to advise uh, the health institutions and the hospitals about possible uh, re-emergence of the virus. Uh, we also collaborate in a number of image analysis projects, uh, helping in diagnosis of COVID-19 cases. Perhaps more general than all these uh, more local projects, we are uh, responsible as uh, 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 by delegation of the Spanish uh, Health Institute, that is part of the Spanish uh, Ministry of Science, of hosting the Spanish database of COVID-19. This is putting together all the viral genomes, all the human genomes of COVID-19 cases, plus the medical records. This is a big effort uh, linking the many projects that have been already mentioned, financed by the Spanish government, producing this type of information and the contribution of the hospitals. This is probably going to be, if we manage to do things properly, the largest database in Europe of COVID-19 cases and as such will be an essential resource for research preparing for what are the conditions that lead to more uh, severe cases of the disease, uh, retrospective studies on drugs, but also uh, analyzing the course of the disease during the, the time in the hospital. So I think this, is, uh, this will be an, an essential uh, database in preparation for the future. This, data, this database is integrated with the European efforts to build an European central database of COVID-19. This is done in collaboration with EOS Life, with the European Bioinformatics Institute, part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, and with Elixir, this European Infrastructure for Bioinformatics. Again, the same that for, for Spain at the European level, if we manage to put together a substantial number of cases with all these genomics and medical information, this will be the, the, the resource that we need to study the disease and to provide uh, uh, avenues for the treatment in the future. With all that, uh, essentially, we are trying to be better prepared for the future. 
uh, seeing the, the severity of the cases in Spain and in other countries, we have to be better prepared. We, data has to be accessible. This has already been mentioned before. What we have learned, we knew that before, but this has been a hard learning, is that accessibility of the data is essential. Open and free data is the only way we can make progress, obviously under the GDPR uh, regulations, but still access to the data. And, uh, and then being able to put together under these conditions of open data, all this amazing capacity that we have on, on computing to build models and to do analysis on this data. To finish, I want to, to remind you that the next session is room four, five, and this is going to be a joint venture between a number of countries, mainly Spain and Portugal. So my Nostrum 5 will be a machine owned by Spain and Portugal. And uh, by now, Portugal and Spain has integrated the um, high com performance computing capacity. So now we have an Iberian uh, network of high performance computing. So you can submit project to this network and have your, your runs done in any of these centers distributed in the Iberian Peninsula. And we are now preparing for an Iberian uh, data network in a way that not only running projects, but also storing data will be possible in a federated European uh, Iberian uh, way. So all these are, are things that are going are happening as we speak. And uh, I think they are very good basis for thinking in the future with data will be more accessible, computation will be easier, and we will, better, we will be better prepared to support the health and research systems in cases like the COVID-19 pandemic, and essentially trying to be better prepared of what we were uh, this time. Thank you. Thank you much, Professor Alfonso Valencia. Um, so we are now officially uh, about 40 minutes uh, um, behind schedule. So never more than now, the expression science takes time has made more sense. Uh, right now we will have Monica Ptencourt Dias, scientific director at uh, the uh, Institute Gulbenkian of Science. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. I had to record this presentation as I'm having today and uh, tomorrow at uh, the scientific uh, advisory board meeting of uh, the Institute Gulbenkian of Science. So I look forward to seeing this event later on in this recorded version and also to perhaps visit the INL in the future as I've never been there before. I think it's very appropriate when we talk about interdisciplinarity to, to think about this poem by John Godfrey Sachs, which is called The Blind Man and the Elephant, where he talks about an Indian fable uh, where six blind men who come across the elephant for the first time in their lives, they try to conceptualize it by touching different parts of the elephant from the eye, the back, the tail. So, what happens is that all blind men come to feel a different part of the elephant and it leads to complete disagreement on what an elephant is. I think now it is clear that we need different perspectives that talk to each other to prepare for and tackle something as complicated as the COVID-19 elephant. This is also how we tackle scientific problems at the IGC and how my colleagues have been addressing the COVID crisis from different perspectives, from immunology, statistics, uh, virology, but it's also uh, something that happened in the, we've seen in the context of the crisis uh, where we've actually learned a lot. So a great example, I think, of this multidisciplinarity and interaction of different uh, parts is the context of serological tests, which we've developed uh, in the context of a national consortium called Serology for COVID, and which require the immunology expertise of IGC, IMM, CEDOC, as well as the protein-related expertise of IBET and ITKB. The scaling up is requiring interactions with uh, different companies and uh, the applications of these tests and its use in research and diagnostics is also requiring the contact with many academic and government institutions as well as hospitals and again government. And not just uh, making this happen but also the funding uh, also involved different institutions from uh, local government like the City Council of Oireish but also the Gulbenkian Foundation and Sociedad Francisco Manuel Sánchez. So I think this really encompasses a great example of um, something that is produced based on basic knowledge from different disciplines, in this case, Nobel Prizes from the 70s and 80s on molecular biology and antibodies, 
but also on the collaboration of people from different hallways of life and institutions that come together to work towards the same end. So what do I hope for the future? What have you learned? So there are three different aspects that I would like to discuss very quickly. So one of them is the support for interdisciplinary fundamental science. I think many of the deaths that are occurring in the world could have been avoided if we were better prepared in the needed fundamental science, but also in listening to scientists before making decisions. Besides biology, we should not forget sociology and history as they tell us about what can happen. Just think about the similarities between now and also what happened in the US in the case of the so-called Spanish flu. We know that any crisis can come in many different formats and, and we cannot anticipate it, but we can prepare for them uh, funding excellent fundamental science which often does not produce the immediate results that we would like to have, but uh, history has shown us that it is the best way of preparing for the future. The second aspect is to promote science in different parts of society. I think it's now clear for everyone that scientists can be very useful in hospitals, in schools, in the media, in companies, so not just in the scientific uh, institutions or uh, universities. So I think this is really, if we want to promote a more evidence-based society, then this is really a wonderful time to promote the integration of scientists in these different sectors of society. Finally, as the example that I've discussed in terms of the uh, serological testing, I think this is a great time to promote collaboration across different sectors of society. This crisis opened the door to many important collaborations across disciplines and sectors of society. So, we can learn more about how to better coordinate because not everything has been well coordinated, but uh, if we learn that we really can uh, build together a much better society guided by the best evidence in its decisions, but also that we all can achieve our goals in a faster way. We now have seen what each other can do from scientists, companies, government, hospitals. We live in the same society, so we can work together. And I do hope that is the future. Thank you very much for the invitation and have a great event. Thank you very much, Monica Betancourt Dias. Now, for the next three minutes, we will have Enrique Vega Fernandes, co director of the Champalimau Research um, in Portugal. Welcome. So, thank you so much for um, the invitation. It's really a pleasure uh, to be with you all and uh, with INL in, in, in particular. So I, I really would like to give you um, a little bit uh, and share with you a little bit what has been our um, experience, particularly over the last two or three months um, in, in the context of, of this pandemic. So um, Champalimau Foundation has basically two main operations, a clinical center and um, a, a research center within the same building. And from very early on, as probably many of the um, healthcare institutions, we were confronted with um, uh, uh, unmet emergent needs. And those really related to first protecting our frontline workers, clinical staff, and second, and most importantly, protect our patients. So testing was really priority number one, and very rapidly we actually implementing um, a testing capacity in terms of diagnosis and also in terms of uh, serology that will allow us not only to diagnose and monitor the health of our uh, patients, the health of our uh, collaborators. And that really started with what I would call an intramural necessity or a MAT need. But very rapidly, and this was similar to multiple institutions in, in the country as well, for this intramural need, we actually started collaborating with other institutions along um, uh, 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 across the country uh, in these sort of extramural efforts um, to bring out and collaborate into studies of determining cerebral prevalence, in particular in, in, in first-line workers, um, uh, in particular health uh, uh, 
care professionals, notably uh, nurses in two major um, uh, national hospitals, um, and, and also been other frontline workers, particularly in the south of, uh, of Portugal. So this would be what I would call the emergency action. Then obviously there's something extremely important, which is how do we monitor the disease? And especially from a clinical point of view, this is extremely relevant because this disease comes in multiple flavors and actually having a, a, a better understanding of the evolution of this disease and defining clinical endpoints is absolutely critical. So the foundation of Chipalimo Research has actually been coordinating a global effort, an international uh, consortium that really aims at defining um, clinical endpoints and also understanding how specifically uh, the immune system contributes to um, the progression, the onset and the resolution of uh, the disease. This is obviously a global um, effort. And uh, in this consortium, there are actually different geographies that are represented, ranging from the United States, Saudi Arabia, China, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, really reinforcing this idea of uh, collaborating and uh, cooperating both at a national level, but also, and importantly, as well as an international uh, uh, level. Uh, another point that was not touch upon um, uh, too much, and I think it's, it's quite relevant, uh, maybe I would put it as a sort of um, uh, a long-term need relates to treatment and how to deal with patients that overcome the disease, but actually had severe consequences for their health. And we've been hearing a lot of reports related to um, malfunctioning or, 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 or of, um, uh, of the lungs, in particular of the kidney. So we've been really involved uh, both with academic, public, and the private sector in actually pushing forward quite rapidly um, uh, data that we actually generated in fundamental and basic science into treatment options, notably in small molecules that could be used very rapidly by um, small startup companies, but also with the big um, uh, pharmaceutical companies in the re regeneration and rapid recover of tissue damage that is inflicted by COVID. So just to uh, terminate, so, uh, or to finish, um, Shumpalimo, by its uh, uh, clinical operations and research operations, we've been basically um, putting all our efforts into these three main uh, pillars, testing, prevention of our co-workers, and obviously the treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrique. Thank you for the work that you are all doing. Now, from um, the Institute of uh, Molecular Medicine in Lisbon, um, its executive director, Maria Manuel Mota. Welcome. You are muted, I believe. I'm sorry. Thank so you very much. This and, and, and still do these mistakes. Uh, first, I was saying thank you very much, Anel and Lars, for inviting us and uh, giving us uh, giving us the opportunity to show what IMM is doing. If you don't mind, I will share my screen and just show go through a few slides because I think it would be uh, nicer, you know, to 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 do this. And so, if I share these, basically. Then I go to this and let's see if it works. Okay, so I hope you can see. So um, many of these things were already mentioned by others. We also have three main uh, kind of pillars that we have divided and uh, I'll go through them very quickly. So uh, Institute in Cinema Leclerc IMM is really uh, located at the heart of the University of Lisbon. We are a private institution, but in fact, one of our founders is the University of Lisbon. And within this big campus of University of Lisbon that really comprise all these, we are part of this campus here that is really the uh, hospital, uh, University Hospital, Hospital Santa Maria and Medical School. And so I think our participation, in fact, you know, appeared because of, of this contact that we have a daily contact with our uh, with the clinicians and the students. And one thing that was arise very quickly on 10th of March, I sh should say, so even before we were closing, uh, immediately the medical doctors showed that they were very worried with lack of tests and the lack of reagents. And so basically we went through these developing uh, a test that is in all similar, we didn't develop anything new, but basically we created with 
Portuguese reagents and Portuguese kits that were available for RNA extraction and PCR uh, tests that could be made with everything made in house. And, and so uh, this, I should say, that was also received very well by the Portuguese authorities. We had started to develop this by March. 12, March 13th, and by March 20, we already had the test being certified by uh, the, the National Institute uh, and the, uh, basically the, the Government Institute for Health. And by uh, March 24, we were doing all the validations and crossing between different institutions. And since March 31st, we have done already processed more than 17,000 17, uh, samples for diagnostic, for PCR diagnostic. And this was like our first and what I sh should say, very short term response that, you know, it happened immediately in the first week. But uh, we immediately start to have other tasks. Force researchers and our scientists were wanted to really get involved and see how they could help. And, and basically, what we realized is that obviously we would be in need of developing a serological test. And this, uh, Monica Tenkudi has already alluded, we were part, we are part of a consortium of five different institutions in the Lisbon area to develop also a serological test based in Portugal with protein produced by IBET, one of the Portuguese. Portuguese institutions, and the idea is that we would not would be quite cheap and would not be lacking any any kind of reagent. And hopefully, this will help also with other tests being developed by other institutions to monitor the uh, you know the development of herd immunity in, in in the country. And obviously, we hope to contribute on that. And it's just a laser test that we are developing. But the other task force, and one that we consider that is probably more long term, is really uh, the project that we call Discover. And basically, uh, we had a few of our scientists that wanted to develop a task force and understanding the virus itself, SARS-CoV-2, and disease. And so uh, our first kind of approach for this type of task force was basically to create a kind of a, a platform inside the biobank. We have a biobank of human uh, samples, but just dedicated to COVID-19. And indeed, until now, we have collected more than 3,000 samples from uh, patients that have gone through Hospital Santa Maria, different types of samples for different types of studies, all with that approval obviously and and so will be things that are being used already now to question to answer questions that we already have and will be stored also for future questions to be used by our researchers and researchers in the country or around the world obviously we our idea is to uh, communicate through all these and but this uh, project also had other developments and one of the requests that we start to have is because IMM has a P3 facility, it was to isolate the virus and so we have indeed isolated uh, virus in Portugal and this virus is now being used for a project that I think is a very interesting project and to be prepared if there is a second wave. We are in collaboration with our blood, national blood bank to develop and is our virologists with immunologists that are developing two different assays for um, neutralizing antibodies. And so the idea is to really uh, store plasma from individuals that uh, have survived COVID-19 and have made a huge amount of antibodies, but antibodies that are really good uh, neutralizers of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, mm. And so this, in fact, really comprises, uh, you know, uh, the majority of the task force that are being developed at IMM that go from the immediate effort that was necessary in the first weeks with testing and now more developing uh, tools that we think Think can be necessary in the future. But I would like also to leave here uh, a message that I think is very important. Yes, we, we have all together as a scientific community, and I think throughout the country, this was uh, really amazing, we came together to develop uh, the tools that were necessary to fight this. And I think we are prepared to go until the end, until this is necessary. But we also cannot forget that, you know, as scientists, we have a lot of talents in our institution. We have more than 400 scientists with many talents, and we should not all concentrate our efforts in a particular aspect that is very important in our present life and is going to be 
uh, very important in the immediate future, but we don't know what are going to be the challenges for the future. So my message is, yes, we should put a lot of effort now, but should not forget to still save energy and put in efforts in other aspects of science and discovery that will be really uh, important, I'm sure, to the future. Because one of the message that this crisis brought to us is that indeed uh, science is necessary to develop quick tools, but we need to have discoveries that were made in the past. So really, I think this is uh, an important message that we should not forget. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Manuel Mota. Uh, once again, um, cooperation is the flavor of the day uh, when we talk about COVID-19. Uh, and now another dimension of the fight against the disease with Gonzalo Orfão. A medical doctor and uh, also the national coordinator for emergency at the Red Cross Portugal. Welcome. Hi, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. Of course, it's Red Cross for this meeting. Yes, we have another dimension of response. Since the beginning, of course, it's Red Cross starts to prepare the response as a humanitarian crisis. We start uh, thinking a short period of time we started the COVID ambulance, we started in reinforcement of social response, namely elderly people. We started with a strong psychological uh, support. This is the normal response that we are used to, uh, that we are used to, to face during some weeks, during some months. But in this particular case, uh, we need to innovate. We need to, to see that our response is the need that uh, the population need for us was not for a short time response, but maybe for a chronic response. In that area, we start from the beginning and one of the legs that we see that uh, they are demanding us and uh, were demanding our help was about testing. Uh, it was particularly important that uh, the testing cap capabilities nationally uh, should be improved. So, uh, Porsche's Red Cross start, uh, start a, new, a new place for testing. We start in the, the fixed uh, spot in Lisbon. We start with uh, more than 100 tests per day with the IMM uh, protocol. But uh, since the beginning also, we start this testing capabilities with a triage smart, as we called with a startup enterprise, a Portuguese enterprise, uh, that we are not just only looking for COVID testing, but also start looking for some signs that we can uh, add to the value of doing the, the diagnosis and try to innovate in this diagnosis. Uh, nowadays, we have more. We have made more than uh, ten thousand testing nationally. We have this fixed uh, post, but we also have uh, mobile units that goes nationally over the, the countries. And in no days, with a partnership with, with other institutions, we are starting a new research protocol in the serologic area, in the serologic testing, so we can understand better because how to be uh, an operational and for the research units, uh, not only for diagnosis, but also for return for the normal life and understand how we can help these people that we are being following up with several testing, how is the, the moment that they can return safely for their normal life. And uh, in a sum up view, this has been the, the innovate response that Portuguese Red Cross has been trying to do. Thank you for all. Thank you very much, Gonçalo Waterfall, for having closed the session on the Iberian perspective. Now we will head to um, another theme. How can we work together? Now joining us from Israel, we will have Professor Dror Fixler, the director of the Institute for Nanotechnology and advanced materials. Thank you, Professor, welcome. Hello, and thank you everyone to invite me and joining this event today. Uh, as I understood, I will show with you a little bit what we did here in Israel. And the main idea is to work together, working together. This is the main theme, and not only in the 
local area, not only on the country area, but we are talking about international. Uh, the first fact that we need to understand and to make it much, uh, uh, to accelerate it, the understanding that there is no replacement to science. All peoples lock themselves inside their home by the rule of the governments, different governments, and everyone looks for a solution. Where this solution can came from, only from our places, from the science, from the medical, from the nanotechnology, all aspects. And uh, education, training, and understanding that uh, not doing nothing, it's impossible. We need to do proactive and trying to uh, help ourselves. Uh, this is our main mission in, in our lives. Uh, as we heard before, it's not make sense to change your research topic, your application, your industry uh, direction due to any kind of crisis that's happening. And uh, researchers that didn't deal before about any kind of aspects that deal with this uh, disaster have nothing to do due, due to uh, this way. But if you have some modest uh, changes, like if you worked on Zika virus, you can very easily change your focus and changing the, the sample of the virus, and this definitely makes sense. But the main idea, what we have uh, seen very clearly, that as a single player, you cannot do anything. And I can share with you a little bit what we did here in Israel. It's a combination of uh, what we did here at Barilan University. In Israel, we have six universities. And all of us work together. We try to work with our regular collaboration. We have uh, some few email exchange with INL as well. It was not become for any practical aspects, but uh, here we build a, a, a full service, meaning 24 hours, seven days in a week of services for companies and researchers uh, that fighting this uh, disease. And uh, mainly nano-research, we have a lot of biologists and two of them are straightly working on, on this kind of viruses, but uh, uh, the major part of our people are working on closed segment, and I would like to very shortly to provide one example how we took the people that work and help a lot uh, to fight this, this disease. But we have a, a full service that we provide, like regular days, for all companies and the researchers that needed them. Next, we share this information at the beginning in uh, each three days meeting, at, uh, lately it's become weekly meeting, a uh, two hours meeting that we are sharing everything that happened and what we are planning to do for the next week. And in these meetings we have, uh, the group includes 65 people and uh, um, weekly basis it was around uh, 40, 45 people that uh, joining this event. And we have, uh, 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 coordinators between the universities, the six universities, that shared the outcomes from these meetings from each university globally. And by that, we help the um, health uh, uh, centers and the hospitals. We help the, uh, the Israeli Defense Force and the intelligence was highly involved in this uh, disaster this time. And we worked with them together try to find terahertz sources in order to detect the virus, uh, trying to find uh, uh, ways to improve the mask, you know, the, uh, uh, the regular mask uh, uh, defense against 300 nanometers. This virus size was 100 nanometers. You need to verify it for medical doctors that you are not harming your people. And I would like to share with you one example of what we are already doing, there are plenty of uh, grants that we applied, but one active game that we are playing as a nano center, me as a researcher, it's about surfaces and uh, coating surfaces with uh, a nano silver. This Please repeat the question. We are listening, Professor Dror. Okay, okay, I'm continuing. One example and with this I will finish. Uh, uh, we are we developed a special polymer that we have inside embedded uh, nano silver particles that 
killing the virus, totally destroying the virus. And uh, in addition to this polymer, we have some kind of paints that we are uh, uh, cooperating, the, uh, uh, the nano silver, and uh, uh, using it for uh, contaminate surfaces for public places that uh, we are really afraid that the virus can infect easily other people. The main problem that we face is that uh, ooh, the world's, uh, World Health Organization claims that nano silver is dangerous. It's like a, a, like a toxic element that we should not uh, use. And we are working uh, during all the year with the faculty of law about regulations uh, and uh, mainly about uh, uh, new technologies that maybe uh, impact uh, uh, economics and uh, uh, healthcare. And they immediately helped us to go all over the process of regulation in order to uh, provide this uh, application, not fighting directly with the, with the disease, but uh, uh, protecting people by uh, eliminating and decreasing the chance that they will be infected in public area. And this is what will lead us soon using airplanes and uh, uh, other uh, public places that all the plates, plastic, uh, uh, the, the chairs themselves may be infected. And by adding this kind of polymers, you are much higher, uh, much, much safe uh, in this case. And I think that the mission that we need to take from here is to build a bridge and uh, some kind of headwater that before the next crisis will happen, we will have an address when something similar is happening, we are immediately open that and sharing things not only internally in one university or one country, but we can do it globally all over the world and especially with neighbor uh, countries. And I'm really happy about uh, what Lars is doing here and opening the, the podium here from this session to different countries. But the main mission, it's not only to share what we did and tell stories, it's to think what, how we are preparing ourselves for the next case. Maybe it will happen only 10, 20 years, no care. If we are building something and keeping it working, something to keep alive, keep alive that this uh, system is still alive and then we can share things and it, it will be smoothly and not trying to think who is involved and how. Personally, we are involved in, with different uh, countries in Europe now in different uh, uh, proposals for Horizon 2020, two of them with INL and uh, uh, with Austria and Germany and others. We need to establish it as an encore uh, hopefully soon, regular days, that we should not forget what we feel, what is the experience, and taking this as a real action for uh, uh, the next days. So thank you again to give me the podium, and uh, uh, let's continue the session. Thank you very much, Professor Dwell Fixler, for bringing us the example of Israel where um, everyone is rowing to the same side and uh, to uh, reminding us and for reminding us that the best way to, um, uh, to cope uh, with the crisis is by being prepared and we can do that by working all together. Um, now, um, coming from Sweden, Jan Erik Sundgren, the now president of Sweden Nanotech, and former rector of Chalmers, and also um, a former CTO of Volvo. Welcome very much. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, conference. Interdisciplinary is uh, probably has never been as important as, as it is right now. Uh, for the last uh, 15 years, I've been working in industry, and as was said, uh, among 10 years with the Volvo Group, which is one of the largest uh, uh, truck and bus manufacturers in the world. But currently, I'm engaged with the Swedish Association for Engineering Industries, as well as with European Roundtable for Industry. And um, interdisciplinary and cooperation has, has, is crucial, of course, for, for any industry that are competing on a global scale. 
if you want to make a truck, for example, it's a rather complicated process, which requires a lot a lot of, of suppliers. It requires a cooperation with, with universities. It requires a cooperation with politicians in terms of securing regulations are, are sufficient and standardization is, is uh, good enough. And of course, it requires also cooperation uh, with, with customers. Uh, what we are seeing right now, in, in, in addition to the catastrophic uh, medical and pandemic uh, issues, uh, we also have a catastrophical economical situation and uh, we eventually will have to sort of reopen the economy and, and come back into whatever the new normal is. And uh, in doing that, there are a number of issues that need to be, be addressed, of course. And uh, I fully understand that the academic world and also uh, most of the world is focusing on, on the health issues and, and getting a uh, viable vaccine uh, in insufficient quantities. But there are other issues that need to be addressed as well going forward. Uh, we, we need uh, to secure that we also utilize this crisis to, to, to increase the cooperation and break down silos that to some extent hinder, for example, the environmental issues, uh, sustainability issues, uh, uh, circular economy of being broadly adopted. We also need to put much more emphasis on, on the uh, digital uh, skills in, in Europe and particularly on also on digital infrastructure. And all this re really needs uh, uh, interdisciplinary and, and cooperation. Let me take one example of autonomous vehicles uh, that, that, avoid, uh, that avoid collisions and avoid uh, fatal accidents. Uh, in order to create such vehicles, of course, it's not enough that, that you have scientists that are, are engineers. You need, you need computer scientists, you need behavioral scientists, you need people with uh, political science. You need quite a lot of, of scientists being involved. So, so when it comes now to, to sort of open uh, and, and securing that we get into to a new normal uh, and get into a situation where we will sort of mitigate the unemployment and, and come back to reasonable economic development. Uh, what are the problems and what, what is needed? First of all, I think there are still many silos that need to be broken down. Uh, silos among, among uh, co uh, cooperation among companies, but also silos in, in the sense that we have a cooperation from the industry point of view with the academic world. Uh, uh, we also need an educational system uh, where, where also the silos are broken down and where interdisciplinary and, and focusing on, on global issues are important. And I think competence supply is something that we should really focus on now, that the, the uh, ministries of, of higher education and ministry of education should take the, the possibility of utilizing this uh, uh, situation uh, to, to uh, upgrade the skills and also to do reskilling. I think so. I think that is an cruci crucially important part going forward. Um, I'm, could also be worried about the fact that the national depth are, are increasing tremendously. I mean, Europe is soon approaching an average 100% uh, uh, depth uh, in, in relation to GDP. And uh, that, that has to be paid back somehow. And uh, that means that the risk of, of reducing resources for uh, research and innovation is there. So we all need to sort of focus on securing uh, that we don't uh, uh, come into a situation like this. If we want to harvest uh, in the future, we can't uh, reduce the seeding uh, right now. Uh, 
we also, of course, need to focus on, on, on uh, uh, important issues in addition to, the, of course, the health uh, uh, and uh, issues related to the pandemic and, and issues related to sort of mitigating uh, further pandemics that might occur. But we also need to focus on, on strength uh, that strengthen both the national states and, and Europe. Materials, uh, material science is such an area. Another area is the digital uh, situation and, and a third area, which has also been pointed out very clearly by the Commission, is the green transformation. Uh, and um, as I've said before, uh, finally, I think uh, uh, skilling and reskilling is, is of utmost importance. Uh, we will have unemployment figures uh, that we haven't seen before. Uh, and and uh, those that are will be unemployed, uh, we will be sort of from all type of categories, categories with all types of backgrounds. But we need to make sure that instead of uh, um, the people that are un unemployed uh, basically waste their time, uh, we need to secure that they are, are reskilled such that they can meet the, the upturn that eventually will come and, and get back into the safe and, and good type of, of uh, occupation. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm quite worried about the, the, the uh, return back to whatever the normal is, uh, but if we utilize this, um, this crisis, uh, perhaps we can get something good out of it. Out of it. And cooperation, I think, and interdisciplinary is the key. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan Erik Sundgren, uh, for bringing us so many interrogations um, that we all must learn from. Um, now, from from uh, Madrid, Spain, uh, we have Marina Villegas Gracia, uh, institutional uh, CSIC delegate. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers, dear Lars, for the invitation. And let me also join in the memory of those who have died from this disease and their families and to those who are trying to overcome it. Well, in the context the pandemic has led us, science has acquired unusual significance also in the yeah. And while fighting against this unknown threat, the return to science and to the scientists from all areas of knowledge. Inter, trans, multidisciplinary collaboration has become essential, as in the past few years was announced, probably after this crisis, this collaboration, this working together is here to stay. In fact, CSIC, as Jesus Marco has told, has already told us, has created an interdisciplinary platform, one of the of other many, uh, which is called Global Health, with this idea of interdisciplinary collaboration in mind. In this platform, as uh, this Global Health emergency has to be attacked on many fronts and from many scientific areas, uh, it's are a real joint of many scientists, from the most obvious, those health and bio-related for prevention, protection measures, protocols, transmission of the, of the virus, mechanisms of infection, structure, structure and genetics of the virus and its evolution, severity of the disease and sequelae, immune response, vac vaccines, therapies, new application of exciting, existing drugs, etc. to also more relate to the social impact of the disease, such as economic, political, environment, and also scientific impact. And I will some examples that that explain why uh, uh, the researchers are really worried about this area. It related to organization of the society. This new normal, uh, we should in this new normal we should monitor how the disease has affected or will affect the organization of society. 
with special incidence on vulnerable groups, uh, previous pathologies, elder population, poverty, displaced persons, gender equality, abused women, women, etc. It's known that the economic crisis has substantial implications for gender equality, for example, both during the downturn and the recovery. The regular recessions normally affect men's employment more severely than women's employment. However, the employment drop related to social distancing measures has a large impact on sectors with high female employment shares. In addition, the closure of schools, whose impact on the students, on the other hand, will also deserve to be studied, and the closure of daycare centers for the other people have massively increased the care needs which has a particularly large impact on working women. Anyhow, some good news arises. Some businesses are rapidly adopting flexible work arrangement, and there are also many men who now have to take responsibility for care modifying in the distribution of labor at home. Other implications are, for example, for politics. This disease is demonstrating the need for cooperation with supranational and regional institutions institutions as well as the identification of deficiencies and inefficiencies and the design of new protocols. It is a great opportunity to lay the foundation for scientific advice in institutions, parliaments and for policy makers. In economics, this pandemic is fueling the growth of a new at home economy, for example. E-commerce and grocery delivery services can test new concepts to better meet consumer needs for convenience and health and well-being. This new economy will urgently need more and better technological development, cybersecurity, and new analysis of personal data protection. Implication for environment led us to cities that should take steps to become carbon neutral and to be more livable and sustainable. It is necessary to know the relationship between contamination and COVID-19, and also, for example, how the analysis of contamination can help to know the spread of the virus, having into account that the virus can create clusters with the dust particles and be carried and detected in PM10 or how the confinement has produced changes in the behavior of our society, such as an increase in the consumption of plastics. And finally, the implication for science. We are witnesses a great acceleration in the knowledge generation. The enormous work of scientists in all areas, this interdisciplinary making science, is producing papers, projects, and a lot of data, but what data? Sorry, but one question is if all these data are useful, and the answer, from my point of view, is no. Let me explain this. Let's remember, for example, an article later with Rome that described the strange similarity between the AIDS virus and the new coronavirus. This strange similarity, similarity made possible to consider to consider that SARS-CoV-2 was designed in a laboratory. The withdrawal of this article came late. It was the most viewed work in BioXIV with more than 200,000 downloads and tweets that reached thousands of people who believed the conclusions because the article was based on scientific conclusions. This recalls in some way the Wayfield's article linking MMR vaccine and autism. Brass partly combines with science. The science, technology, and innovation system needs well-run machinery with enough funds and talented human resources if a progress as quickly as possible is desired. But science needs a minimum time to develop and conclusive studies. This is, last is my uh, personal opinion. And this is what I have to say about the, the platform and the work is doing the SIG related to COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Marina, for coming back to INL. Now, playing at home, we will have Dmitry Petrovic, corporate expert of INL. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, I'm glad to have an opportunity to uh, tell you uh, a little bit about the 
efforts uh, at INL uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, of course, the main contributions from INL uh, are in the area of technology. And of course, we're working on some new technologies uh, for diagnostics and for therapeutic options, as well as for materials that can protect uh, against the virus. So these are the kinds of things that uh, the previous speakers have also mentioned as happening at other research organizations. Um, what I would like to highlight uh, right now um, is actually uh, more about the uh, place where technologies could enable something in a more immediate sense, and that would be related to testing. And of course, again, you know, many of the previous speakers have already mentioned the critical importance of testing. Um, one of the um, aspects that I noticed is that the typical numbers uh, mentioned so far have been in thousands, maybe tens of thousands. In fact, even the, the very large and very nice uh, serological survey reported from Spain, um, I believe uh, in the paper it listed uh, having tested something like 70,000 people. Um, so we're talking about large, but not population scale. Um, and of course, um, one of the recommendations from the WHO, uh, uh, one of the early recommendations that came this year was that community level testing would be really important. Uh, and this uh, we consider as kind of an ambitious goal, but also a goal that uh, would be uh, extremely important for uh, being able to basically return uh, to the new normal and also to follow up uh, in this pandemic. Um, so what are we talking about when we talk about community testing? Um, several uh, attempts uh, to do this have been done um, in the West, primarily at the scale of typically small towns, so several thousand people. In fact, right now, um, there is an ongoing uh, community testing in Wuhan in China, where in less than two weeks, they are about to finish testing roughly 10 million people. Uh, and really, that is the scale that uh, you know, would be interesting to, let's say, talk about. Um, so in, uh, you know, closer to home, um, uh, one of the first uh, really successful examples of community scale of community level testing was actually in a small town of Po in Italy, uh, where in the, at the height of the COVID crisis, um, everyone was tested and then tested again two weeks later and uh, performing uh, this uh, experiment allowed to both track the spread of the infection and in particular to track the asymptomatic individuals. Uh, who actually was spreading the infection. So it was extremely successful. Um, the challenge is, of course, that, uh, again, you know, uh, in Europe uh, and in the United States, uh, often these kinds of efforts tend to be on the scale of, you know, tens of thousands uh, compared to China, where uh, they're able to uh, roll them out in millions using the RT-PCR technology. Um, but of course, you know, we still believe that even using, let's say, a less perfect technological option, um, so things like the antibody tests, um, it still would be uh, both possible and uh, actually quite important to administer, uh, again, community level testing uh, uh, in, in European countries. And of course, you know, for example, starting in Portugal, uh, because again, these kind of uh, campaigns would help to reveal the asymptomatic carriers and also uh, will help to monitor the dynamics of how the infection is being spread. And again, you know, not just within the waves of the pandemic, but even, for example, once the vaccine uh, is developed and is being administered, uh, actually the effectiveness of the administration of a vaccine will need to be monitored. And of course, again, safe return to workplaces uh, would basically uh, rely on similar large-scale uh, testing um, as well. In this particular case, we believe that Portugal actually would be a really good uh, country to attempt uh, to do this type of a campaign at the national level, um, in part because the uh, local authorities, uh, so the parish councils or the Juntas de Freguesia, they are very, very strong in Portugal and very active, and they would provide the necessary infrastructure. And of course, again, in collaboration with volunteer organizations, you know, such as Red Cross, from whom we've heard earlier. Um, and where the technology will be, one of the places where technology will be uh, crit critical is that um, once uh, one considers the idea that, in mil that millions of tests need to be digitized, so millions of tests means thousands of tests per day per testing site, um, this really cannot be done manually, uh, just basically uh, it would introduce extremely long wait times and so on and so on. And these are the places where technology could really help to basically deploy something that already exists. 
And of course, you know, we have some ideas at INL about what types of technology, and we already have been talking with some of the uh, industrial partners about the design and even the production of this type of technology. Uh, and of course, again, if, the, if, if Portugal uh, uh, chooses to pursue this type of strategy, it would also be quite important to uh, develop the uh, domestic production of the uh, testing supplies, again, as some of the previous speakers have already mentioned. Um, so to conclude, um, I think that uh, one of the uh, reasons why we wanted to highlight this concept today is that um, this uh, highlights the importance of not simply considering the limited resources that we have available right now and making future plans based on them, but rather thinking about uh, perhaps you know, ambitious and bold actions that would actually make a big difference at the national level, and then considering what would be the relevant technologies that have to, that have to be implemented in order to support them, and basically making plans uh, on how these technological progress can be achieved. And of course, uh, in order to implement this, uh, everyone has, work, has to work together. So the researchers, the companies, the government, the public authorities, and everybody else involved. And uh, with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dmitry. Um, um, thank you very much for bringing us all um, that INL is developing. Uh, it is very important now also to know how to make the translation to the common citizen, and for that, it is very important, the role of the industry. That's why we will now um, welcome Antonio Pereira, uh, the plant manager at uh, Bosch Security Systems in uh, Ovar, Portugal. Thank you. We are not listening to you, Antonio. Maybe you need to unmute. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hello, uh, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, and also, it's a, a pleasure to be here. So, we are really the partner of PNL uh, as an industrial uh, partner. So, uh, we produce electronics here in Ovar. And uh, by the way, we have been the epicenter of the pandemic here in Portugal. So, it, it uh, brings us a lot uh, as well. So, we are let's say, the partner that can produce the, the ideas coming from the scientists and going for the materialization. Uh, why we do with it? Uh, first of all, this is one of the purpose of Bosch is inventing for life, so we are glad. Uh, how we plan to do with it? We have been talking to ENL about the technology, so we have our, already in our hands what is needed and uh, how to do with it, uh, which will become from the support of ENL. Uh, experts as well. And what we want to do, uh, we want to produce the lateral tests here in OVAR, and we are able to do, we are capable to do with it. We are also a competitive uh, cost location for that, in order that we go for a massive uh, production. And uh, we are also have the, our R&D center here that is uh, capable to produce the testers and to uh, design the testers itself. Either you go for a mobile solution, either you go for isolated tester as well. So, uh, as a citizen, as an entrepreneur mindset, we see that this is a great opportunity for the society, not only coming from the um, restriction, but uh, rather than that, uh, to promote uh, and release the economy. Okay, that's all from my side. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much, uh, Antonio Pereira. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Now we have um, from um, uh, Stab Vida, the CEO from the uh, company startup Stab Vida in Portugal, Orfeu Flores. Welcome, Orfeu. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I salute INL, Lars, and all the INLers for this initiative. Um, here at Stab Vida, we are a genetics company. We specialize in genetics for uh, already a long time. And uh, actually we do have collaborations with INL in the field of antibodies also. So it's been a fantastic uh, project uh, going on. Our approach and let's say our contribution for, uh, for this uh, COVID-19 pandemic was to, to approach uh, the diagnostics. So it, it, you know, it all starts uh, 
for uh, it all starts with a, a buccal swab that goes to the laboratory uh, and then has to proceed all these protocols of uh, inactivation, RNA extraction, and then uh, real-time PCR um, for, for detecting the virus. At Stavida, we decided to, to try to do an approach that reversed this, um, this path. Instead of the, of the swab go to the laboratory, we tried that the laboratory goes to the swab. So uh, we tried to miniaturize and to develop point of care approach and diagnostics in order to, to do uh, a fast testing of 30 minutes in near the, the patient setting. So the first thing we had to do, actually I, I identify myself a lot with, the, the, with this quest of interdisciplinarity for the approach because what we did here in the company uh, was to mix genetics with electronics, with the hardware, firmware, and we did develop uh, a miniaturized laboratory uh, or let's say a miniaturized real-time PCR that we can now uh, send to the to the point of care. Um, actually, we 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 call it a, a pocket a pocket test. This is a, a mini real-time PCR that connects with a uh, with a smartphone and that performs a test in a thirty minute uh, total time. So we we thought about skipping all, uh, or it was designed in order to skip. The, the, the steps of inactivation, RNA extraction, and go immediately for uh, amplification of the RNA and detection uh, with a probe that, uh, that we inserted in the, in the reagents. Uh, we are very excited with this approach. Uh, 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 still a, a, long, uh, a long path to go, a long uh, work to do. Um, starting right now uh, validation uh, with different centers, different uh, hospitals, settings, even with, uh, with our colleagues from uh, Champalimo Foundation and not only. Um, we do see it very, to be very helpful, this approach of a point of care testing and, to, and, and let's say a widespread and disseminated test. We do see it as a very useful um, in many in many settings, like for instance the senior residence halls, uh, or e even in the pre-intervention settings in the hospitals, one of the things we would like also to to approach is uh, and and I salute that I saw in the audience of this uh, conference I saw Professor Tumininu uh, Debamu from Nigeria, and one of the the one of the collaborations we would like also is to to send this, this small mini uh, laboratory for, uh, for uh, remote locations in Africa and uh, South America. So, so uh, still a long way to go, still a lot of work to do. A lot has been done um, in, in these two months and uh, we hope finally to, to be able to submit our trials and our results to Infarmed in the, I, I hope in the next weeks and to try to get CEIVD approval for this, uh, for this approach. Again, uh, I salute uh, Lars and INL and all INLers and all of, all of the speakers and all of the audience and uh, together with a lot of in interdisciplinarity, together we must end this uh, pandemic and end the, the, the very, uh, trouble effects caused by this uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Orfeu. Uh, now, um, the next uh, speaker will be Professor Elvira Fortunato, the multi-awarded vice-rector of uh, Nova University uh, in Lisbon, and also a um, member of the Scientific um, uh, Council for Exact Sciences and Engineering, um, uh, acting as a coordinator. Um, uh, so, Professor Elvira Fortunat, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, good afternoon, Minister of Science from Portugal and the Minister for Science from Spain, if they are there. Also, Lars, Director of INL, dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation and also to congratulate you on this initiative and to allow me to share with you 
some FNOV university initiatives during COVID, and this is more or less the perspective from the university side. Just to quote a colleague of mine, universities are institutions that interfere in society through knowledge as vital sources for innovative thinking and producers of solutions. The university could not remain indifferent to this crisis and, in addition to suppressing its own internal risks, it has contributed with solutions for of the most urgent need. I'm referring to scientific technological contributions, the production of knowledge, information, and literacy itself. The, Port the Portuguese university as a whole has participated in a national response to the crisis, as it should have done. At NOVA, the rectory stimulated that response, which in its implementation was in charge of the various faculties, research centers, and their business partnerships. So in short, NOVA's, NOVA's initiatives were done at six major levels. So first, diagnosis of the disease. Initially, the infected persons were diagnosed with the tests, and this dominated the health emergency. NOVA through CEDOC, but also in partnership with other laboratories in Lisbon area, was involved in this effort with particular emphasis on volunteering. We had a great involvement with, for example, Santa Casa da Misericórdia de Lisboa, with the testing in old people since they, they are a more vulnerable population. On the other hand, for example, EHMT, has supported with diagnostic tests the Centro Hospitalar Lisboa Occidental of the National Health Service, as well as o CBU at FCT, has been doing the same at South Lisbon region. In the second phase, which is now the serological tests, will allow to know who contacted the virus and developed some form of immunity. This is the biggest challenge to which ITKB and IBET have been responding but also CEDOC in a consortium, Serologic for COVID, where all are in. I would also like to highlight the fundamental role of IBET and ITKB in the production of S-protein, essential for the mass production of these tests. The Institute for Precision Medicine, which brings together biomolecular research efforts among the various schools of NOVA, is now focused its activity on serological screening for COVID to all the university staff, which will be done in June, October, and January. The second target was devices. devices. From simple face shields, fans, or the production of alcohol, FCT played, for example, an absolutely decisive role at a time when these equipments did not exist in, in sufficient quantities. An effort not only by Binova, but by everyone. We started doing what we had never done before. So the third is social impacts. The assessment of the social dimensions of the crisis led by the National School of Public Health involves the analysis of social perceptions, epidemiological research, and occupational health of those affected by COVID. The COVID barometer launched at the, and the set of studies carried out should be highlighted. But also the collaborative lab, the, the value for health, is playing a key role in data collection and processing. The fourth deals with so, so, uh, social and scientific responsibility. The pandemic called what the human spirit can give us the best. The Institute of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine has been engaged in an important collaborative effort with Portuguese-speaking countries, involving everything from diagnostic and therapeutic training to literacy and scientific and epidemiologic consulting. The fifth is communication. The rectory established at an early stage a microsite with a vast repository repos oh, repository of interdisciplinary knowledge. It is named COVID-360, and its researchers have marked a constant presence in the media, giving public voice to the science produced. So finally, 
the part most related to research is translated into projects and collaborations. And NOVI is very active in responding, responding to the various calls and involvement in projects. We have now in Portugal several co calls for COVID as well at the European level. So to create a better post-COVID-19 world, civic universities dedicated to knowledge production and student education for fair and sustainable societies are needed from the learning lessons and grabbing opportunities. We can say that NOVA generally did well in this pandemic without compromising security. It has developed unthinkable strategies for remote learning, saving the school here. It has produced science and created solutions that are useful for citizens, also for the most vulnerable. As a civic university, it has contributed to our collective success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Elvira Fortunat, for bringing us so rich examples of uh, how we can all uh, work together to cope with the COVID-19 and to uh, end this uh, first part of the working together uh, session. We have now Philippe Asureira, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Nano for Global from Portugal. Welcome. Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation and I'm very glad to present uh, the development Developments of Nanofor at this forum. It's uh, quite a privilege for us. So to let you know that uh, Nanofor technology um, is, um, is an awarded uh, technology from the Santander Tota uh, in 2012 and has the basis at uh, FCT, Faculdade de Ciências and Technology from Nova University by the hands of uh, Pedro Viana Batista, um, full professor in nanotechnology and the inventor, and also from uh, Alexandre Fernandes, also prof professor at this university. Uh, which has a, a major um, experience in diagnostics and startup. And myself, that comes from business more, more in concrete, from uh, Genzyme, from the biotech world. So Nanofor was, um, was set up and established in uh, 2015. And since then, we had the four pillars in order to develop the company and to bring uh, products to the, to the market. So the first one, it was the submission of, the, of patents, which, which we have already achieved and, um, and, have this, um, and have this submission in several geographies. Then we have the challenge of, um, of having uh, the, um, the, um, the industry scale up uh, of, um, of the entire nanotechnology that, that was uh, developed, it was achieved, and then also to make it happen in terms of a certification of, um, the, of, the, of our manufacturing plants in order to be allowed to produce um, um, in vitro diagnostics. And in terms of certification, we are 9001 on 13485. Uh, ISO uh, certified company. Then comes the, the third pillar and third part, which was the internal validation of the technology after uh, the scale up. It was achieved and now we are moving for uh, the, then we are finalizing the external validation of our first uh, indication. In terms of regulatory, the first and the last one, uh, which was, uh, which we are we are working with in order to have the submission to the regulatory um, to the regulatory authorities at Informat, and then have sales in the beginning of 2021. So, what is about this uh, technology that has uh, something special? Uh, so, we are. This is based on gold nanoprobes, and that they have the capacity to change color when in the presence of RNA or uh, DNA. So, when it is a red, it's a positive. It changed to blue. Uh, it's a negative. So basically, what was uh, developed and uh, and in terms and now in terms of moving forward to validation, it's a molecular colorimetric uh, diagnostic uh, system. So and it can be in the future fast and potentially fast uh, applied uh, at decentralized level and uh, and affordable. We are developing several indications: tuberculosis, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, and also Zika virus. Um, having this um, 15 years of academia experience and also four years of company during this pan pandemic uh, time, we put the effort uh, to develop uh, uh, COVID um, 
the a COVID indication and COVID uh, technology, and uh, and we did. So we uh, cu currently we are uh, we developed the isothermal molecular uh, system, uh, which allows the screening for RNA of um, of COVID uh, nineteen. And, and, and reaching this point um, is, is really important to focus on the, um, on the interdisciplinary uh, part of the, of the conference and uh, how we are uh, thinking in moving forward uh, this, um, this, this indication and this, uh, and this system that was developed and, um, and can be two parts, one of the short term uh, indication uh, where we are launching this molecular uh, system and we are open for collaborations um, giving and giving the support uh, to the activities that are um, that that are taking place at uh, at university and at academia and uh, and even to move forward and has uh, as minister professor, uh, professor uh, Manelli Tor said uh, as university is coming back uh, to 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 the new normal, uh, there is room for this kind of initiatives. Also, in medium term, uh, this technology can be applied to to several to several concepts. There is one concept that has been developed. Um, I was talking with another CEO of a Portuguese company, Biosurfit, where where they have a quite interesting. Um, they have a quite interesting um, system to, to develop, which is basically a container uh, that can be uh, that can be shipped uh, and th th that has a room in the, um, in, a, in a in a plane in an aeroplane and it can be shipped to to several to several geographies uh, around the world and it's a, it's a lab. Uh, that can be that can be used to 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 massive uh, to massive screening of populations and transportable and um, and and in Portugal what we realize is that we have these technologies available we have technologies on serology on immunology we have technologies like Orfeu referred or or technologies of nanophore that can be packed and uh, in a, in a, in the same in a, in the same in a, in a, in the same uh, consortium uh, in order to take be taken to the field i know that i don't know if we still have fines yeah. in the um, in the in the in the room but uh, we have the technologies in portugal but we don't have the expertise to to move to the to the field and to, to proper validation and the exploitation of this kind of uh, complex solutions but i think fine can give um, a very um, a very interesting help in this um, in this matter so to conclude, um, I truly believe that in short term, uh, Nanofor can help um, academia and uh, and also other uh, um, and other projects in terms of, of screening. In medium term, uh, taking diagnostics uh, abroad in a, in a more um, in a more holistic uh, way uh, that can be developed uh, by Portugal and to be taken uh, abroad. So this was what I would like to, to bring to this conference, and uh, thanks again for, for your invitation. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, this concludes the first part of the uh, Working Together session. We now head to the second part of the uh, Working Together uh, session, um, starting with Professor Alan Barrell, uh, he is a professor at uh, Cambridge and uh, chairman of Cambridge Worldwide Associates from the United Kingdom. Welcome very much, welcome th uh, and thank you very much for your participation, Professor Alan Barrell. I believe you are muted, Professor Barrell. Okay, can you hear me well? Loud and clear. Thank you, well, good afternoon. And uh, first of all, let me say that it is my honor to join this event and it has been a privilege to sit here and listen to the proceedings so far. I have learned a very great deal, uh, but time is running out. So I must be concise and clear. And uh, let me begin by saying that all are agreed, we've heard it all afternoon, 
that global solutions are essential to deal with global problems such as pandemics. For global solutions and collaborations to prevail and contribute to the future avoidance of similar pandemics, trust, open-mindedness, open innovation, those things are going to be essential. We've heard something about it this afternoon. I don't have all the answers to the questions about how the situation can be directed and sustained on that pathway, but I only can say I am prepared to play my part. Of course, I see responsibilities for governments to work together at the level of national and international strategic collaboration involving the World Health Organization, the European Commission, and the United Nations. I can urge such approaches. I cannot bring them about personally. But where I can contribute, and I am doing so today, is at the equally important level that we've heard about this afternoon of practical international communication, connectedness, connectivity. And I have another word for you here, which I first used in Braga in June last year. Connectricity. Connectedness is okay, but what are we connecting for? Bring energy, bring electricity to the connectedness and make it connectricity so that things can be made to happen. So reaching out and listening and learning and exchanging best practices, sharing knowledge, engaging academia, education, industry, investors, in our own locations and connecting innovative ecosystems throughout the world through the actions of inspired people and not simply because governmental processes exist to make connections possible. Now, I've seen in my lifetime, quite a long lifetime, I'm pleased to say, the entrepreneurial spirit break down barriers and destroy unhelpful administrative structures in order that people and organizations that could make a difference were able to sweep away constraints and bring necessary change to the lives of people worldwide. And it seems to me that this is a moment in time for such outreach and worldwide efforts at all levels, perhaps through organizations born of highly innovative approaches to internationalization and cross-border collaboration exemplified, of course, by IML and what we're doing here this afternoon. Forces in the world that can mobilize not only to deal with current COVID-19 pandemic, but bring about the change that so much of these pandemics can become, hopefully, a thing of the past. And I'm so pleased about this event because I think itself it is a positive example of the kind of effort needed and which should be replicated in principle between thinking and capable people worldwide. Because only people will make the difference. And events such as this one today will hopefully be followed, and there will be lots of follow-up to make real and definable things happen. Connectricity. Now, on a specific note, and to underline my emphasis of the importance of real connectedness and connectricity, I'm delighted to be working with a young man who you see on your screen today with his roots in Braga, who introduced me to INL and whose exciting anti-COVID innovation you will hear about a little bit later on when Hugo Macedo addresses you. And I'm very pleased to be supporting his inventiveness and enterprise by promoting his response to COVID around Europe and Asia, because I think he's got something very special. So my final message in these few minutes is let's not forget that we are blessed, we've heard about this this afternoon, with having the science, the technology in so many forms, medical, diagnostic, clinical, therapeutic, and also in terms of artificial intelligence and data management. We have all those things with which to create a safer future world and change the prospects of health and wellness for future generations. Putting it all together to make the most of it is a collective responsibility 
and a very, very great challenge. And concerning recovery from the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm more confident that over time this will be achieved. So my primary interest today and my concern are that the health and wellness issues that have been lacking and resulted in the present economic crisis are elements which should receive our priority attention to avoid future catastrophic events. So thank you for enabling me to make my points today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Beryl, for your concise yet insightful um, uh, participation in this um, con conference. Now from Cambridge, UK to Lund in Sweden, uh, we will have with us uh, Professor Emeritus Lars Samuelsson, um, former director of NanoLund and also member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science and member of the Royal Engineering Academy of Science from Sweden. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm Lars Samuelsson from Phys Professor in Physics and Nanoscience at Lund University. This is uh, indeed a great initiative. I'm happy to return to Braga, although just virtually at this time. Uh, I have to make very clear that I know nothing about COVID-19. I'm actually glad that I have no experience. I'm just a simple semiconductor physicist specializing on nanoscale material science. Uh, Lars Montelius asked me to share with you some of my experiences and perspectives from my involvement in university, spin-out companies, and in the academician role on uh, different aspects of interdisciplinarity, which I'll say a few things about. As a background, exactly 30 years ago, I started uh, this interdisciplinary center for nanoscience and nanotechnology called the Nanometer Structure Consortium at Lund University. And there, from the very beginning, this was in 1990, I had Lars Metelius as one of the even younger ambitious scientists. And he was actually the first head of our, our, our very first nano lab. Uh, during these 25 years, where I was the, the leader of the whole uh, show, the activities grew from about 10 people we started with uh, to today more than 300 researchers. Uh, more recently changed the name to Nano Lund and still developing excel excellently also after my stepping down as its leader. Uh, I think from the very beginning and still today, uh, Nano Lund is focused on interdisciplinary nanoscience and nanotechnology, ranging all the way from fundamental quantum physics, bio applied sciences, and all the way out to bio biology and medicine, but all the time with a the theme being centered on nanoscale material science with a focus on opportunities to design, construct, and apply nanomaterials to functionality. The functionality is based on, on the unique properties. Um, and possibly, it's possible to design nanomaterials, smart sensors, and nano devices that can contribute to the corona COVID. 19 defense efforts in line with the main theme of this meeting. Um, the importance of interdisciplinary research efforts includes also the challenge of not only staying in the academic environment by trying to take world leading research to industrialization and commercialization, for instance, via spin out companies or connections to, to larger industries. I have experience as founder of a handful of such companies acting there as chief scientist, as board member, in a few cases as CEO and as deputy CEO. Uh, deputy CEO more recently in Global B, which is quite a hot company. Um, joint academic institute and company research efforts have been possible to create also with serious funding from the European Union, which has been very important for this combination of basic and applied research development. After my stepping down from the directorship, rather than prefer preparing to go into retirement, I've just accepted to take on the role as director of a new interdisciplinary center. Mm -hmm. Some people can't have enough. Uh, at the Southern University of Science and Technology in Shenzhen, in Southern China. 
focus on very broad interdisciplinarity topics ranging from materials research, optical electronics, energy, all the way to life sciences. With the ambition to also function as a connecting bridge between Shenzhen and Sweden, and also with Europe. Indeed, Lars Montelius and I have identified great opportunities for joint efforts in this area. I want to make a statement. I, I strongly believe that context, collaborations, and exchange with scientists in China will become and be very important. We have heard the requests for global solutions. If I still have one minute, I, th I think. Uh, I say something about my 15 years of experience from my involvement in the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. There I am presently involved in coordinating the Academy's actions in the energy field with actually a very strong emphasis on the super important links between energy development and environmental aspects, which one can talk about for a long time, but I won't do that. I conclude by again referring to what we are dealing with uh, every year with a specific pace namely how we evaluate and make selections for the Nobel Prizes. Yes, and also in relation to the heading of this meeting, the will of Alfred Nobel, phrase it like this, prizes to be given to those who during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to humankind. Many of the prizes we have witnessed in recent years have occurred in the borderline areas between physics, chemistry, engineering, biology, and medicine. People quite often ask, but is this chemistry? Is it physics or is it life science? Indeed, often it was the result of very strong interdisciplinary efforts. So my last sentence will be, maybe if this initiatives that we are part of now, it might be that interdisciplinary COVID-19 research could become a future prize. No promises. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lars Samuelson. Uh, and now we head to the United States with Chad Merkin, the professor of uh, the Northwestern University. Uh, sorry, um, uh, my mistake. So now we will have um, uh, Professor Jeff Miller, professor of um, the um, uh, and director of the California Nanosystems Institute uh, in the USA. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lars, for the invitation to participate. And hello to um, colleagues across seas and good morning from Los Angeles. Um, so I'm director of the California Nanosystems Institute. We're a multi-dimensional, uh, multidisciplinary institute in the center of UCLA campus with uh, technology centers, uh, internal research, as well as uh, considerable commercialization effort with 20 startup companies. Um, but, and we are also engaged in a variety of research and developmental uh, applications uh, to try to deal with the current situation. But given the constraint in time, I wanna talk about two things uh, that I, I, I don't think have been uh, addressed fully yet. And the first is um, sort of a historical perspective the events that we are experiencing now with coronavirus mutations that expand host range to include humans were explicitly predicted about five years ago, actually in a series of publications by some very prominent virologists, namely Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina. Um, we, we, we could see this happening. We saw it happen with SARS-1 in the early 2000s with MERS, a more pathogenic coronavirus, uh, not too long thereafter, we're seeing it again. We not only predicted it, but predicted the gene products in which mutations would need to arise to expand the host range. During that period, there were viable research and development efforts to develop vaccines, to develop therapeutics, but they were dropped. And the reason why they were dropped is because those outbreaks went away. And so, we may have had platform vaccines that were tested and we knew worked and we only needed to substitute gene product for the current coronavirus, but we didn't do that. We stopped and hence we're starting all over again. This could have just as easily been high 
pathogenesis influenza viruses, H5N1, H7N2, et cetera. This could have been a Zika virus mutant. This, God forbid, could have been an Ebola virus mutant that increased transmissibility by the aerosol routes. But the point is that we don't have to be caught by surprise every time this happens. We need to not only remember what's happened, but we need to follow through and bear in mind that this will happen again. And so the, the point I wanna make, um, first of all, is that a really important component of any global response needs to be focused not just on the immediate crisis, but on preventing similar crises like this from occurring on a global scale in the future. We know enough about these viruses to predict what they may do, or at least what the possibilities are, and to develop protective measures and therapeutic measures against those. So that would be my first, um, my first suggestion, is that we also think long-term, and this is where global cooperation really comes into play. We're also gonna need, obviously, a educated workforce. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity for entrepreneurship, uh, where our graduate students and our postdocs design their careers by starting companies. And it is our responsibility, I believe, to, to incubate and to nourish those entrepreneurial efforts. We need a global dashboard, which is put together by molecular surveillance around the world outstanding computational algorithms for understanding what's happening and predicting what may happen and allowing action as a result of it. Um, but we also need some things at a more immediate basis. And I wanna sort of go to the other end of the spectrum in my last two minutes and talk about an experience that uh, in Los Angeles that we've had at our institute. So we have a very productive high throughput screening institute. It's a robotic laboratory uh, we have the capacity to run 20,000 serology tests per day, for example. And so we immediately launched into uh, an effort to develop testing, uh, immunological tests with multiple parameters uh, where we are producing our own reagents, et cetera, and really putting together a suite. The problem we ran into, and this is a problem in the United States at least, that many of some of these similar efforts are running into um, are twofold. First of all, regulatory requirements in order to have your test be used for clinically actionable or public health actionable uh, activities or efforts. And number two, the commercial uh, blockades where medical centers have contracts with testing companies. And even though they did not have the initial capacity and we did, it was still not possible to get in there quick enough and to take up that need for extra capacity and be productive. So the second area I think is for us to look locally, uh, maybe nationally, and to think how can we open the way to allow research institutes like those that many of us belong to and, and direct to really step up to the plate, have an impact, have that impact recognized and make our ability to innovate immediately applicable uh, to public health uh, crises uh, such as the one we're, we're involved in. So to summarize, in addition to focusing on the current global public health emergency equally, and I would say even more importantly, is to realize that this will happen again. Uh, it may be virus, it may be bacterial, it could even be a parasitic infection, but it will happen again. We can prepare ourselves globally but we need the will and we need the financial backing in order to do that effectively. So that's my uh, sermon for this morning. Uh, thank you all and good luck with your important work. Thank you very much, Professor Jeff Mueller for bringing us uh, your insights on uh, what we need to do. Definitely not business as usual, uh, but we need to do things differently if we want to um, be prepared for the next epidemic or even pandemic. Uh, now, uh, from the United States to Braga, we will have with us the president of the School of Medicine uh, at University of Minho, Portugal. Portugal. Uh, so we have uh, now with us Professor Nuno Souza. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. So it's not morning here 
Jeff. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Lars for the, for the invitation and for, for letting um, us learn uh, uh, with each other. Let me just tell you that being the dean of a med school that has a has mission to improve healthcare to the communities we serve in three different verticals. Um, we actually, I believe, we, we showed um, an amazing ability to adapt. So on, on, on the pedagogical uh, vertical, we, we shift immediately to uh, remote teaching and assessment. And to be truly honest with you, um, there were lots of gains in doing that. So I, I think there's a lot to be learned out of, of this situation. On, on the research side, um, it, it was amazing to see um, the number of researchers that were um, able to shift uh, their focus to, to, to let's say, to, to do thousands of diagnostic tests for COVID, um, but also to, 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 to have them engaged in the, into other opportunities to, to interact with uh, with other types of researchers and actually to produce solutions that will impact on, on the way we, we deal with patients. And, and in the last vertical uh, is the, the social value. So we are really engaged into, into providing the best care to communities. And um, so we decided to do that here in the, in the med school by creating a digital medical center. And being a, an MD and dealing with patients every day, let, let me tell you that I would like really to highlight what um, um, Jeff Miller just said, that is the best way to practice is to prevent. And we need to prevent, and that's the, 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 the medicine of the future. So um, Lars uh, asked me to talk about working together, which uh, I believe it's, it's a must, it's not an option if we want to succeed. So um, let, let me share with you a couple of ideas about how to work together and how can we actually uh, face these type of challenges. And I will like to, to share with you four premises. And the first one is the new concept of teams. Uh, long are the days in which we would see uh, papers in, in good journals with one or two authors. Uh, the average today is a dozen. So what does that mean? It means that uh, in science, we cannot solve real problems alone. So it's, it's not an individual that will solve the problem. It's not a single lab that will solve the problem. It's, it's, it's actually, it's a team. The, the second premise is, uh, is tribes and tribologies. So we, we all belong to a tribe and we love to belong to a tribe. Actually, part of our a uh, learning process is to, to learn the tribology. And we, 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 we developed this very sophisticated way of communicating in codes that are really uh, very difficult for others to understand. So um, being a medical doctor, you know, we take a, a couple of years to understand what we are saying to each other. And let me tell you, sometimes we don't even understand what, what we are saying to each other. But that, that's the concept of a tribe. And, and, and the sense of belonging to a tribe is very important. But actually, this, this means that we need also to communicate with others. And, and that's, that's, that's the, 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 the way to the third premises, that is challenges and intersections. I, I truly believe that challenges today are very complex and the one we are facing is certainly very complex. And it, it is in the intersection of different uh, terroirs of knowledge and different codes that we will face um, ways to, to deal with the, the, this uh, really tough problem. The last premise, and I think it's very important for the way we architecture our research institutions, is what I would call the bidirectional flow of research pathways. It, it's very important for us to, 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 to interact between tribes. So in, in this particular case, it's very important to, to listen to the ones who are dealing with the patients because they will probably tell you what are the unmet needs, in this case, unmet medical needs. And then there's, there's a dialogue 
that has to be done with the solvers. People who actually can, can develop interdisciplinary uh, ways to solve problems. And sometimes they, you know, they come to me and they say, I, I have this technique, I don't know what it works for, but maybe you can tell me. And so that this, this bi-directional dialogue is absolutely critical. And actually it's the way for us not only to create the solutions, but actually to validate those solutions. So these are the premises for the new research architecture. So what, what have we learned from this crisis? I, I think that every crisis brings opportunity. And there's uh, several levels of analysis. First, I think uh, my first level of analysis for this particular crisis is that we were not prepared to it in large and we did not anticipate it. Um, by the way, we didn't even respect previous signs and signs that happened in, in, in China. The second level of analysis is that we have to, 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 to set up a, a coordinated response and to establish priorities. And Dimitri uh, earlier on alluded to, to the fact that we need real numbers. It, it does not uh, make any sense to talk about dozens because it, it doesn't help. Uh, so we, we really need to, to, to develop ways to, 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 to actually communicate uh, uh, in larger numbers. And, and, and the third level of analysis is we need to, to respect nature. So in, in, in physiological systems, we have a, a couple of things that we have, we all know. We need sensors. And so we, we really need good sensors and we need to, to, to be disruptive in creating these sensors to recognize the problem. Then we need efficient control towers. Otherwise, it's impossible to coordinate uh, any action. And last but not least, for having a strategic response, we need effectors. And effectors uh, must be at different levels, including local levels, as, as some of you have already alluded to. So in other words, we need to cooperate to, to, to develop new techniques that are disruptive in this context. And I'm very proud to say that we were, we, we, we actually contrast very well Portugal because we did uh, an enormous number of tests uh, uh, per capita. But we need to do more than that. We, we need to create new tests and we need to, 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 to create disruptive technologies that then can be validated in proper clinical settings. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to be humble and to, 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 to be sure that we know very little. So uh, Lars said that he didn't know nothing about COVID. I, I must say that I, I, I don't know anything about physics and I do know very little about COVID, but I see a lot of patients and I see the problem there and I see that we need to work together. And I would like to end by sharing with you with you an example of what we did together with engineers. So we, we were told that it would be impossible to create mechanical ventilators in Portugal. And you know, every time someone is told it's impossible, we really get the, the drive to, to, to make it happen. So we worked together with engineers and after 40 days of engineering, we have created a, a mechanical ventilator that has been validated preclinically and we are ready. To, to go to patients. So this tells us that we can work together and if this uh, uh, bi-directional flow is effective, we actually can, can face uh, solutions. Um, we can beat uh, the challenges, but even better would be to anticipate the challenge and be prepared to, to face them in a much better shape. So that's what I would like to share with you. And it, it has been a pleasure to be uh, here with you, listening to you and learning from you, as Alan uh, said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nuno Souza, from the School of Medicine at the University of Minho, an example of um, working together with the uh, next speaker, Lorena Diegues, Medical Devices Group Leader at INL Portugal. Welcome, Lorena. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my pleasure to participate in this session this afternoon with so many um, colleagues that are working together towards the same challenge, which is uh, COVID-19. Let me first tell you a little bit of the perspective of INL's Health Cluster, who, uh, which uh, is a group of, of colleagues that I currently coordinate. 
The Health Cluster at INL is an interdisciplinary team that gathers different scientists, biologists, chemists, physicists like myself, that we work together to develop uh, nano-enabled health technologies for the benefit of society. I think that the main uh, learning point for us during this uh, couple of months has been the fast response and adaptation to be able to apply our knowledge and our existing technologies and capacities to develop new solutions, mainly for diagnosis and, and therapeutics, but also with, with the help of other colleagues beyond the health cluster, uh, working in development of new uh, personal protective equipment, new coatings, and so on. Um, what I think I can say as a general um, of the work that we have done at INL, um, what I will highlight the most is the reallocation of resources. So we had to adapt really fast and uh, we, we adapted um, the teams and the uh, tools to be able to work into ongoing projects that happened at INL uh, labs and also in collaboration with other colleagues. Those are related to serological tests that have been mentioned a few times this afternoon in collaboration with ICBS, University of Nino, Hospital de Braga. Um, but also the development of uh, breath analysis, uh, also in collaboration with Bosch and um, and other colleagues, I won't uh, waste time in, in naming them all, I'm sure that they won't complain. Um, we also created a fast action to apply for funding because in order to have uh, our best response, we actually needed to deploy uh, as much uh, tools as possible. And we submitted uh, many proposals to national and international funds. Two projects have already been funded and are ongoing. Um, in collaboration with the Portuguese Institute of Oncology to de develop new uh, diagnostic tools. But beyond uh, these uh, specific actions, I, I wanted to, um, to get a bit of my personal perspective on, on how we can better work together. And I'll start by naming interdisciplinarity, of course. Um, what, what we are facing right now is not an R&D uh, challenge. This is not only research and development. In order to, to be able to provide uh, an efficient response and to be able to provide tools that are actually being go going to be used by society, we need to complete R&D with innovation. And, and this needs to be fast. Uh, rarely innovation is fast or the tongue around of, of innovative medical technologies is fast. And so for this purpose, we need to put together interdisciplinary teams. So not only scientists from the very broad range like microbiology, virology, molecular biology, biotechnology, uh, microfluidics, immunology, um, uh, colleagues that are able to develop proteins and aptamers, as well as antibodies, um, nanotechnologies and nanoparticles, for instance. But we also need to gather the whole other uh, list of uh, stakeholders. We need to work with mechanical engineers, electronic engineers, advanced materials and advanced manufacturing um, partners. We also need to work with simulations in order to extract the, the best of the data that is provided to us through artificial intelligence, machine learning. We need to work really closely with the medical doctors. Nuno was just mentioning uh, that so that we together can find a solution for their needs. Uh, and we need to work with the regulators so that these solutions can run the necessary clinical tests to be uptaken uh, in the market. And for that, we also need to work together with the diagnostic companies. And this is yet another challenge because we also need support from governments in order to motivate the diagnostic companies to work um, perhaps with a focus not so much in the profit, but actually on the, on the greater good um, in a sense. Uh, that brings me to the next topic, which is internal internationalization. Um, we rarely have all the capabilities that are needed in, in a sole city, in a sole country. We need to work together across the globe, and mainly when this situation is a global challenge. We have been working over the past few months with uh, partners from all over the world. We have had very close um, exchanges with, for instance, China. We have uh, very good colleagues working there that not only supplied um, materials for our developments, but also that were kind enough to volunteer and to, and to lend a hand in more, um, let's say, solidarity actions. Uh, so sending us PPEs and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but I guess the, the key element um, that I want to finish with is openness. It has been brought up a few times already this afternoon, but I guess that only a fast action can be concerted if we are able to share data, to share experiences, and to share teams and, and, and tools and techniques and laboratories. So um, I guess uh, open access publications is a must. Fast peer review process is a must so that we can learn from the learnings of other groups and implement the results into our own research. Um, and also, uh, perhaps we should develop new policies to enable this open access. So beyond uh, GDPR, to enable a fast pass um, a open access share of knowledge between not only researchers, but uh, all institutions across the value chain. Um, then, uh, and also with society. So also communicating these results in an understandable way to society, because we have all witnessed how our detailed explanations uh, have not really sunk through um, many parts of society where there's a lot of uh, still, um, let's say, uh, not well understood um, issues that keep coming up. Uh, I guess that we all have a WhatsApp group with family members that keep asking us for updates or our opinion. So we should find a way on better broadcast um, this, this general knowledge. And I just want to finish by saying that um, we should keep working together in order to learn from this experience and to be better prepared for the future challenges that surely are waiting us uh, around the corner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorena, for uh, being with us. Now uh, we have um, uh, Hugo Macedo, who is the founder and CEO of Smart Separations, um, um, Portuguese-born startup um, incubated at INL, and that won recently uh, a pitch from the European Union. Um, thank you for being with us, Hugo. Thank you. Uh, God after midnight to the Director General of INL, Lars Montelius, but tarde to the Portuguese Minister of Science and Technology, Manuel Leitor. Thank you, Manuel. I couldn't agree more with your compelling speech on the need for more scientists to collaborate and address the global response to COVID-19. Buenas tardes to the Minister of Science and Innovation of Spain, Pedro Duque. Boa tarde to the Mayor of Braga City, Ricardo Rio. And good afternoon to our panelists and everyone who's listening to us online. I would like to start by thanking Dr. Laz Montelius and the organizing committee for your very kind invitation to participate today in this discussion, which is so dear to us here at Smart Operations. We are facing the worst economic crisis in a century. The world has been in lockdown. And how do we effectively become COVID secure and respond to this COVID-19 crisis? Unprecedented times call for unprecedented solutions. Our smart coatings can destroy the coronavirus on surfaces and our coated ceramic filters can destroy it in the air. And with the spread of coronavirus, these are the two core areas that society still needs to address. And it's easy to say, stay safe, but to do so, we need to breathe safely, touch safely, and earn safely. And that's how we'll all live safely. We've developed a COVID-secure strategy for coronavirus to drive the government to take action for all of us. Already tested against human SARS-CoV-2, we've got the two missing solutions to present to you. Smart coatings are important. They destroy rather than just remove viruses, bacteria, mold, and fungi. As scientists, our values champion scientific rigor. As entrepreneurs, we want to be successful, bold, and scale fast. And as human beings, we want to take our products and our COVID secure model to save lives. Our ceramic microfilter technology destroys coronavirus in the air. We will soon be launching Genome that destroys airborne coronavirus. Come and talk to us. Kickstarter will be launching soon. Then we're launching coated masks, coated gloves, and our rapid and globally scalable solution, antiviral stickers. With coronavirus remaining on surfaces for up to three days, anyone can apply stickers to the most important surfaces in the most important settings. Schools, care homes, shops, hospitals, transport, and businesses. There's no shortage of where we need to destroy coronavirus on surfaces and in the air. Manufacturers want our products, businesses want our products, but what about governments? They haven't answered our messages. Proposals sat on desks, meeting invitations unattended, silence. Our execution strategy is solid and enables quick response and mass rollout of these solutions. So we've developed an approach to seed and scale in each country. I'm Portuguese and born in Braga, so what's better place to start our pilot phase 
than here with IML on our backdrop. We have a trial starting soon in Braga, the city hospital, the care home, and the school. Governments need to listen and hear more carefully to what is coming from the scientific community. As a startup entrepreneur, I know the challenge of not letting silos emerge. Science and business need to intertwine. And it's hard. I should know as founder and CEO of Smart Separations. For business people, I'm a risk, as I'm a scientist. For scientists, I'm a risk, as I'm a businessman. But the bigger risk is not making use of this technology. It's not listening to other promising emerging technologies that could help. We need scientific entrepreneurs to fill the void, not focus on a quick buck, but on long-lasting essential solutions. And I call upon those of you in power, make room, pause, breathe, and just listen around. There are dozens of scientists I know working with incredible solutions. We need to bridge that gap. We need to fill that void. We need to break down silos. We need greater humility. We need more answers. We need to stop trying to protect our reputations. We need to collaborate fast and at scale. Together, we're scientists and problem makers, entrepreneurs and problem solvers. We're manufacturers and forecasters, business management and politicians. We're working day and night to bring these innovations to life. And we're poets with the problem, the product line and the proposition, with the solutions, and manufacturing, with the factory that we're developing, the people and the clients. But there's one thing that we need from you to scale. Government contracts to help destroy coronavirus, kickstarting the economy to benefit all of us. Government ministers come and join us, improving quality of life through innovation. We are smart separations. Thank you. Ugu for bringing us such a good example of how science and uh, companies can and should work very well together to serve the market and to serve every one of us. Um, and this brings us um, to the closing remarks um, that we will move uh, forward um, in a, a moment. Thank you very much uh, for all the speakers uh, for being so patient, for waiting for your turn and also for the ones who are um, watching us. Um, the closing remarks will be here shortly. And now for the closing remarks, we have with us Bjorn Segerblom, the chairman of the INL uh, Inter International Business Advisory Board and also um, INL representative at Hong Kong. Welcome, Bjorn. Jörn? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm chairing the International Business Advisory Board of INL, uh, internally uh, called EBAB. And we are a team of uh, international businessmen and uh, industrialists from various technology sectors, of course, based in Europe, in the US, and in Asia through myself in Hong Kong, although I'm currently stranded in my native country, Sweden, because of the corona, uh, still for a while. And uh, uh, we uh, are there to try to assist INL to become an international top class solution provider. We help opening doors. We are now uh, very much engaged in coaching INL's research clusters, and we are also engaged in mentoring uh, internally. Now, I think uh, it has been said already uh, of a few of you that it has been a true privilege really to participate in, in this wonderful event. And I know that I can speak also on behalf of all our colleagues and friends who are participating over YouTube. And just let us remember, think back for uh, five, six months, none of us in January or even beginning February had the faintest clue uh, where we would be in to, uh, today. Everything has totally dramatically changed. We are facing, uh, still for a long time, massive uh, challenges, massive suffering, 
massive risks, massive financial exposure, etc. But also massive efforts everywhere to counter this, uh, of a level that the world has never ever seen before. And as this conference also this afternoon has demonstrated clearly, massive support for working together and urging for interdisciplinarity, uh, which by the way is a whole, one, another hallmark of INL, strong focus, etc., etc. And uh, just remember also, if you think of how quickly we all have become Zoomers, uh, we have become so much faster uh, digitized out of necessity, of course. And as one speaker said also, as a new normal, everything is already going much faster. I think also we have all, most of us at least, adapted very quickly to this new life, which shows also how flexible we are. And, and um, uh, I think also, I'm sure, that something positive has to come out, out of these massive investments globally now, uh, searching for uh, COVID-19 vaccines and pharmaceutical treatments, etc. Now, clearly, the, the next couple of years will continue to be very challenging and very uncertain. I was already before uh, joining this conference, so to say, in spite of all this, an optimist. Uh, now, even much more so after this, uh, uh, this conference with all the insights and uh, demonstrated uh, high ambitions, willingness and confidence that we will succeed to create uh, for the future uh, a better and safer world, safer in, in a way that we must this time not lose it again. We have to be better prepared before the next pandemics, as, as some has already said. And, and uh, I do also hope and believe and expect more concerted efforts, for instance, on the other crucial uh, challenge the world is facing, namely, <coughs> namely climate change. And let us also remember, we are on the verge of getting 5, 5G as a new, another new normal with all that, what that will mean for Internet of Things, for instance, and with artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality, etc. So uh, all, all this uh, means that uh, and things will continue to go faster, I'm very sure. And, you know, we, as I live in Hong Kong since many, many years, although I don't speak Chinese, uh, that's one thing I will never be able to learn. I, 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 you need really full time to do it. But some of you probably uh, know already, um, I, I can't write it, but uh, the Chinese sign for crisis at the same time, which I think is quite illustrative, also means opportunity. The same sign means both crisis and opportunity, and that, that in a way, I think uh, sums a lot of, of what we have been discussing this afternoon. Now, uh, regarding follow-up, the one thing uh, we have uh, gone over time, which does happen very often in conferences, as we, as we know, we haven't had time for any Q&A. I would suggest and recommend anyhow that uh, if Jörg can uh, afterwards open, maybe that's intended already, a follow-up forum where all of us can send in uh, comments, uh, ideas, suggestions, recommendations, etc., that we others uh, other can can share, which is also a very inefficient and easy. And we must do this while minds are fresh. If we wait a month or even two weeks, where so many other things have come, so we we forget about it. So, please. If that happens, let us start with that right away, uh, when my minds are fresh. Finally, uh, really on behalf of, of everybody, including, I think, uh, all of you fantastic speakers, I, I wish to 
uh, extend congratulations and thanks to Lars and the team at INL plus the extremely strong support and invaluable support and engagement from the two member states of INL to have uh, in an unbelievably short period of time. Just think of this. I know for sure when Lars mentioned to me, I think less than three weeks ago, about this conference to happen. And it has happened. That would have been impossible six months ago. That also shows <coughs> uh, how things can be done and will be done in the future. So let, let us keep this in, uh, inspiration also as we go forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Björn. Um, we were counting uh, on having here with us um, Anna Abrunhosa, the minister, the Portuguese minister for territorial cohesion, uh, um, and also Manuel Eitor uh, for the final remarks, um, the, the minister of science, technology, and higher education. However, duty calls. Um, we will have the final remarks of this um, conference with uh, Professor Lars Montelius. Uh, our Director General. Thank you, George. So I would like to say that I, I think this has been a fantastic afternoon to listen to all the presentations. I'm very much uh, a big thank you to all of you that have contributed and all the people that have contributed also listening and also giving comments on YouTube, etc. So thank you very much. Uh, I have some, some kind of learnings that I, I would like to bring to you. And I think it has been evident that scientific collaboration is the key for the future has always been and will be even more in the future. And we see it now in these kind of mission-oriented approaches that we need to bring people together. But it's not only about the scientific cooperation, it's not about the societal cooperation. The scientists cannot do things on alone. It's really together with other people, other stakeholders, that we can make a difference. So I think the, the bringing everyone together, which we try to do in this conference today, is the mean and the way to, to, to move forward. And as you know, has been said before, INL is an intergovernmental laboratory. We were founded by Spain and Portugal about 12 years ago. And we are a true global actor. We have people from 40 different countries working here. Right now, about 450 people, all kinds of disciplines. And we have invited all our ambassadors of these people from the different countries. So we have principally have 40 ambassadors or embassies listening to us. This is really true global action in order to create a multi-stakeholder perspective in order to get people together. So this is one, one important thing. The third thing is that I think we need to, as has been discussed already, learn from this learning experience. We cannot only do this and then forget about it. We need to learn so we can be prepared for the next, uh, let's call it the next pandemics or the next uh, global challenge that we will face for sure. And if we can learn from what has happened now, we will have a much better chance to do that in the future. And then I think the, the other thing that was kind of touched upon was the connectivity. And it goes with this kind of connecting the different stakeholders, connecting the people, having the connectivity, and also use, I would say, this face-pace mindset, which in some way could be translated as an, entrepreneur, as an entrepreneurial mindset, and I think this is the big difference. When we're facing a challenge, something really big in front of us, we're all coming together being very much solution-oriented. And this is the kind of the, the way how businesses always work. So I think we can bring in this kind of entrepreneurial mindset into the more scientific developments. We can also do science development much faster. And of course, science is not a patchwork. Science is not there to have solutions when something happens immediately. Science is there to build the foundations for the future. So we really, we, we really need to work together and really develop science, which I think was echoed also by, by the ministers of sciences in Spain and Portugal previously. And then I would like to, I think, end up with one thing. And I think everything is really about people. It's we, the people, that make the difference. If we are not passionate about our work, if we don't have the vision, nothing will happen. So it's all about people, and I thank all of you that have been participating here for a great afternoon, and thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for 
your uh, closing remarks, Professor Lars. This whole conference will soon be available at INL channel on YouTube, so you can revisit uh, all the in insightful talks we had today um, on uh, the quest for interdisciplinarity. On behalf of the team that uh, took this conference to you, um, thank you for being with us. I would end with the wise words of the renowned author uh, Simon Sinek, changing the world takes more than everything any one person knows, but no more than we know together. So let's work together. Stay safe. Thank you.